Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. This is the Select Budget Committee. Today is June 17th, 2020, and it is 10.05 a.m. The meeting of the Select Budget Committee will now come to order. Will the clerk please call the roll? Peterson? Here. Sawant? Here. Strauss? Present. Lewis? Present. Morales? Here. Council President Gonzalez? Here. Chair Mosqueda? Here. Seven present. Thank you very much. Council colleagues, we have a long set of meetings in front of us today. This is the first of two meetings. We have session one and session two. Session one begins right now at 10 a.m. We will start with public comment and then have an overview of progressive revenue proposals. You'll see from the attached documents, there's a number of attachments, including the previous bills that we've talked about from our council colleagues, um, council member Sawant and council member Morales. We also have the opportunity to hear today from central staff, a walkthrough of the proposal that I shared with you yesterday, which I'm short-terming the Jumpstart Seattle proposal. We do have um, this as a discussion item for today and want to uh, thank the council colleagues who have um, asked for oper the opportunity to have ample amount of time to talk about proposals and, and really just have a discussion today. Thanks to central staff for walking through those various pieces and really providing us with a robust understanding. We will have public comment today, and I would want to thank um, all the people who've called in. I know that there's a number of people who've called in. We'll try and get through as much as we can. Um, and then it's a reminder, we do have an afternoon session as well. This will be session two, which starts at 2 p.m. I understand that public comment for that session opens up at noon. So if you haven't had the chance to sign up for public comment this afternoon, you're still welcome to do so. At 2 p.m., our focus is going to be on the budget. We do know that the mayor's office has not yet submitted their 2020 revised budget. So today we continue our inquest in the Seattle Police Department's budget and spending. Today we will be ha we will have the opportunity to hear from five other cities as well as we look into what opportunities potentially exist at the local level to address the call for action from Black Lives Matter movement and local activists. So um, wanted to provide you with that update uh, that this afternoon will be really a continuation of the conversation that we began last week on the inquest and specifically hearing from elected members across the, the country. Again, that's at 2 p.m. this afternoon. The portion for this morning's agenda is focused on progressive revenue. And while it is um, focused on revenue, we know that people have probably called in to talk about a whole host of things, including the budget and perhaps the Seattle Police Department's budget specifically. So we will welcome public comment on any of those topics. At this time, council colleagues, I'd like to see if there is any objection with the agenda in front of us. If there's no objection to the agenda, the agenda will be adopted. Are there any objections? Hearing no objections, the agenda is adopted. Council colleagues, it is 10.08 and I'm going to try to get through as many people as possible who have signed up. We know that there is a lot of, a lot of individuals who have signed up for public comment today. As we continue with our working from home um, situation given the current public health pandemic, we wanna thank folks for being flexible with us and navigating through the inevitable growing pains that we've all experienced in real time. We are continuously looking for ways to fine tune the process and adding new features for additional means of participating in these public council meetings. It remains our strong interest to remain committed to having public, uh, public comment on each agenda. And that includes at the very beginning so people don't have to wait on hold because we know we're already asking you to come early to your computers and log in. Public comment today, again, is being divided into two parts. For those who are not having the opportunity to speak this morning's session, you will be able to register again at noon for our 2 p.m. meeting. Please note, speakers will be provided one opportunity to speak either at the public session, this one at session number one or number two, ideally not at both sessions as this will allow for us to hear from as many people as we can during our allotted time. I'm gonna moderate public comment for this morning in the following manner. The public comment is going to be up for 20 minutes. And at that time, if there's additional folks, I will consider reauthorizing for additional time. Folks, you're gonna have one minute to speak 
at the end of your one minute, please try to wrap up your comments because the, the microphone will cut off shortly thereafter. You will hear a chime at when you have about 10 seconds left, that will be your indication that it's time to wrap up your comments. Please do say your name and, um, and begin your comments right away. You will hear you've been unmuted and that will be your prompt to go ahead and start speaking. Thank you so much for um, your flexibility as we're really trying to get as many people to comment on these robust items as possible. When you have completed your public comment, we do ask that you disconnect from the line. And if you plan to continue following the meeting, please do via Seattle channel on TV or through the other listening options that are identified on the agenda, including live streaming and the opportunity to listen in on the listen in line. If you do not get a chance to um, comment publicly and you're not able to um, uh, get through, uh, please do know that you can email all of us at Seattle um, at Seattle dot or council at Seattle dot gov. Those items are also listed on our agenda for today. So we have a lot of folks signed up to testify. I'm going to queue up people in the order that we've received them and um, greatly appreciate you all for being here. And again, to our IT and communications folks who are helping from home um, to make sure that we can get folks signed up. We have a long list and I appreciate all of your work as well. Okay, the public comment period is now open. I will call the first three people and we will um, let you know that you've been unmuted. Um, the first three people include Aaron Height, Gabe Pelly, and Elena Perez. Aaron, welcome. Good morning, Council. For the record, my name is Aaron Height, representing the thousands of members of SEIU 925 who live and work in the city of Seattle. I'm here in support of Jumpstart Seattle. Um, as I've testified before, accessible childcare is critical in our economy, and it will be absolutely essential to our economic recovery. But we were short on childcare access before COVID, and now it's even worse. As of June 12th in Seattle, 148 licensed programs have closed, representing a loss of 9,000 slots. That's a huge percentage of licensed care, and the same story is true across the state. On top of that, some families have been keeping their kids home from care, leading to a 45% drop in enrollment across facilities in King and Pierce County. These two economic shops, shocks, plus the fact that childcare is operated on the margins pre-COVID means a lot of these small businesses may never reopen. That's one reason I'm here speaking in support of Council Member Mosqueda's Jumpstart Seattle legislation. It includes dedicated recovery money for small childcare businesses so they can restart, pay that back rent, get that PPE, start caring for the kiddos again, and get the parents back to work. Um, but largely, SEIU 925 has supported past efforts to reform our upside down tax system. Our members are some of the people paying that 17% of their income. Thank you, Aaron. Sorry that you were cut off. Please do send your remaining comments if you can. Appreciate you calling in. Gabe Pelly. My name is Gabe Pelly. I'm a resident of District 4, and I support, support both defunding SPD and Council Member Salant Morales' bold proposal for an Amazon tax of $500 million per year indefinitely. I also want to acknowledge Council Member Mosqueda for introducing your bill, but I ask if you support progressive taxation to address the pandemic and affordable housing crisis, why not support the Salant Morales legislation? It's because these bills are based on fundamentally different strategies. Salant and Morales based their approach on a grassroots fighting movement of thousands of working people. Mosqueda is basing hers on trying to win over the very few wealthy business owners that will be taxed. But big business will always be hostile to taxes. They may play nice temporarily as they're doing now faced with the strength of our movement, but Thursday they will flip again when they re regain the upper hand. We saw that firsthand in 2018 when an initial tax of 150 million was cut to 75, then 47, then repealed, all in an effort to accommodate big business. But we've introduced the ballot legislation that we've gathered 15,000 signatures for. Gabe, thank you for your time. Please do send your remaining comments as well. Elena Perez, followed by Misha Worshful, Paul Chapman, and Jessica Scalso. Hi, thank you. My name is Elena Perez with Puget Sound Sage, and I am calling um, on behalf of our uh, coalition South Corps. We had sent a letter on May 4th um, in support of progressive revenue, and I just wanted to lift that up. Our communities have been under threat from wide scale displacement for many years. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown the importance of community resilience 
in the face of a public health and economic crisis. And our community organizations are on the front lines of keeping people, people healthy, safe, and secure in their homes. South Core and allies have long advocated for building resiliency through community ownership of housing, cultural, and small business space. While the city has launched several programs, such as the Equitable Development Initiative, uh, which we are very thankful for, they have not met the need in our communities. We want to thank Councilmember Mosqueda for lifting up progressive revenue and continued leadership from Morales and Councilmembers Morales and Suan. We urge you to adopt a new progressive revenue that uh, prioritizes communities. Thank you, Elena. Misha Worshko, welcome. Good morning. My name is Misha Worshko. I'm the executive director of the Washington State Budget and Policy Center, calling in to support the legislation before you. Our city is facing interlinked crises, as you know, of the public health pandemic, economic crisis, and institutional racism. And this legislation responds to these urgent crises and lays the groundwork for an equitable recovery. Three reasons that we support this proposal. First, it boosts our economy by getting millions of dollars circulating in our city um, as we get people back to work in the phase reopening. Second, it focuses resources on those most impacted by the crisis, immigrants and refugees, people experiencing homelessness, small business owners, and others. And third, it helps balance our tax code. Washington State has the most regressive tax code in the nation. And this proposal, by being paid for by a tax on highly compensated employees at larger companies, helps move us in the direction of a more equitable tax code. Thank you. Thank you so much, Misha. Before we go on, I want to thank Councilmember Juarez, who I understand is with us as well. But thanks for calling in, Councilmember Juarez. Our next speaker is Paul Chapman. Thank you, council members. It's been just over three weeks since the death of George Floyd sparked the nationwide reckoning of police brutality. Here in Seattle, we've not received an apology or an acknowledgement from Chief Best and Mayor Durkin for the brutality, police ineptitude, subterfuge, gaslighting, and lies disseminated by the Seattle police up to and including Chief Best. We've not heard repentance and reconciliation. We've heard defiance. We must hold the perpetrators responsible. We must defund the Seattle police. We must remove Mayor Durkin from office. There is no reform without defund, no demilitarization without defund, no justice without defund, no repentance and reconciliation without defund. Now is not a time for Seattle process where we talk a good talk until the right plan, the moral plan, the just plan withers and dies after years of exhaustion. Last night, the 43rd Democrats voted overwhelmingly to support defunding the Seattle police and to remove Mayor Durkin. Be bold, do the right thing, defund the police, clean house, be nationwide leaders, Thank you. Thank you very much. Jessica, welcome. Hi, my name is Jessica Scalgo. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I live in District 3, and I want to encourage the council to defund the Seattle Police Department by 50% and use that money to fund black and brown community-led restorative justice programs. Um, there are already many to choose from, such as community passageways, and King County Equity Now, people are already doing this work and have been doing it for years. They just need funding, so we don't have to spend time and money figuring out how to do this. Um, our budget reflects our city values, and right now we're saying we value surveillance, control, which is often violent, and protection of wealthy property owners. And let's make it about restoration, equity, and opportunity instead. If we want to change, then we need to stop funding the systems that are perpetuating these inequalities. And then also, I support tax Amazon, so we need to get that going as well. Thank you for the time. Excellent. Thank you. Jason Fields? My, my name is Jason Fields, and I live in District 5. I unequivocally support the following measures. Immediately defund the Seattle Police Department by 50%. Drop any proceedings, civil or criminal, against protest arrestees, and permanently increase taxes on Amazon by 500 million based on the proposed Sawant Morales Amazon tax, no sunset clause. Amazon must be taxed. Amazon is profiting during the pandemic, and Bezos's personal fortune is increasing while working people are suffering. A failure to permanently tax Amazon is a vote for economic violence against working people. Moreover, the recent violence against protesters has shown that the police are out of control. I personally witnessed excessive use of the force during demonstrations. It's clear that the police's role is to intimidate the public. We must increase public safety 
by defunding the police by 50% and invest in our black and brown communities. Thank you, I yield my time. Thank you so much. The next three people are going to be S. Charshole, I'm so sorry to mispronounce your name, um, Logan Swan and Jorge Baron. Um, S. Charshole. I'm, I'm S. Charushila. I speak as a Seattle resident and as an economist. Although I'm a professor at the University of Washington, I speak here in a personal capacity. Nothing I say represents the university or any of its units. Um, we know face a crisis of systemic poverty, homelessness in this city. We also know that this cannot be solved by growth alone. This has become clear with 30 years of data in the U.S. and elsewhere. We also know that the policies we need to address this are going to requ require long-term, comprehensive, interconnected policies, which need revenue. So I really urge the city council to consider in a state which has regressive taxation, the crucial need to have a tax base that is both large enough and which is long enough without a sunset clause in order to be able to fund these initiatives. Thank you. Thank you so much. Logan Swan. Hi, my name is Logan Swan. I'm a rank and file union iron worker, and I'm calling in support of the Swamp Morales legislation that will build 10,000 affordable homes for our community, creating 10,000 jobs for my building trade sisters and brothers, paid for by taxing Amazon and big business, not working families. I think it's deeply unfortunate that Councilmember Mosqueda has chosen to excuse herself from the many events our tax Amazon movement has held, bringing thousands of working class people together. Instead of joining our community and discussing what we need and how we can fight for it, the state has been absent, prioritizing hearing the voices of the same businesses that oppose workers fighting for 15 in a union. Progressive taxation, uh, taxes on the wealthiest in the city don't need a sunset clause. The creation of affordable housing and good union jobs don't need a sunset clause. These are the things that should be uh, a constant uh, in our city instead of what's been a constant, which is taxation that goes disproportionately on the shoulders of working class families. You still have a few seconds. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Logan. Um, Jorge Baron, welcome. Uh, Committee Chair Mosqueda, Council members, thank you for the opportunity to address you today. My name is Jorge Baron. I'm the Executive Director of Northwest Immigrant Rights Project. Our organization provides immigration and legal services to low-income people throughout the state of Washington, including many Seattle residents. And I'm speaking today in support of the package proposal that Council Member Mosqueda announced yesterday, Jumpstart Seattle. Uh, we believe that this proposal will represent a strong step forward in making sure the city can address the substantial impact of the current public health crisis. As all of you know, that crisis has had a disproportionate impact on certain communities, including immigrant and refugee communities. Uh, we support the Jumpstart proposal because it would help ensure the city will have the resources to address the fiscal crisis and continue the city's commitment to support all of its residents, including immigrant community members. We think this is particularly important given that many immigrant families are excluded from some of the safety net programs that are protecting the rest of the community, like unemployment insurance or the recent uh, stimulus tax payments. We urge you to support this proposal. Thank you for your consideration. Jorge, thank you so much. Appreciate all you're doing right now um, during this crisis for immigrants and refugees. The next three people are Sujatha Ramni, Richa Dub Duby, and um, Brian Krishner. Sujatha, welcome. Hi, can you hear me? My name is, hello, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Hi, my name is Sujata Ramni. I'm representing the Coalition of Seattle Indian Americans today. Our community strongly supports and follows the lead of the Black Lives Matter movement. We also support Councilwoman Savant's tax Amazon proposal. The Reverend Martin Luther King said, quote, you can't talk about solving the economic problem of the black person without talking about billions of dollars. You're really tampering and getting on dangerous ground because you're messing with captains of industry. We are treading in difficult water because we're saying that something is wrong with capitalism, end quote. If the city council is honest about caring about black lives, it should have the courage to take on the captains of industry like Amazon. Support the tax Amazon bill. Council member Mosqueda's bill raises less than half the amount needed and with sunset clauses displays a total lack of commitment to the black community. Please do not settle for this capitalistic fig leaf coral jumpstart Seattle. Thank you. The next person is Racha. Richa. 
Thank you, Council members. My name is Richard Dubey. I'm representing the Coalition of Seattle Indian Americans today. Our community strongly supports and follows the lead of the Black Lives Matter movement. We also support the Sawant Morales Tax Amazon proposal. Today I speak in memory of my father, a retired Indian Army general who spent over 25 years living in a village in India to build a school for disadvantaged first-generation school attendees. He passed a year ago, and it's his birthday today. We say Black Lives Matter, so let's put our money where our mouth is. We know that economic disparity, especially now, has a racial bias. We also know that the tax Amazon bill will raise $500 million per year to fund COVID relief, permanently affordable social housing, and the Green New Deal. We do not need Mosquera Sunset Clause. We know a company at a $7 million payroll threshold would pay just $91,000 under the Amazon tax. It does not harm small businesses. Thank you. I cede my time. Next person is Brian Krishner. My name is Brian Kirshner. I'm a District 4 resident and executive in a technology company and founder of an organization called Tech for Recovery. Our mission is to insist on the urgency of taxing tech workers like us. I applaud the spirit of Jumpstart Seattle. Public investment will both meet immediate needs and accelerate recovery for all. I urge the council to support this payroll expense tax tied to high wage workers like me, proposed by Council Member Mosqueda. I also urge, consistent with the sunset provision and a commitment to progressive revenue, to treat this as a step in the right direction rather than a final destination. This crisis will make the tech sector even bigger than it was before. We won't have equity or tax justice until we have progressive taxes directly on people like me and my colleagues. I urge my peers who run tech companies to commit their organizations to making this happen. Thank you for your leadership on this issue, Council Member Mosqueda. I cede my time. Thank you, Brian. The next three people are Karen. Toring, Robert Cruz, and Emily MacArthur. Karen, welcome. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, thanks, Karen. Go ahead, Karen. Can you hear us? Thank you. Yes, I can hear you now. I'm on mute. <laughs> My name is Karen. <laughs> My name is Karen Toring. I'm the general manager of Black and Tan Hall in uh, Seattle District 2. I am calling to support progressive taxation and support community resiliency through ownership. What I like about Mascada's bill is the fact that it looks out for the Office of Economic, De the Economic Development Initiative, of which Black and Tan is a member of the cohort. And we've seen that particular fund work, and we want to support that. If you believe that Black Lives Matter, as other people have said, then this budget is your moral document. And from what I can see from my own lens, the tax Amazon bill and the jumpstart bill are not in opposition of each other. I don't see why one, both of them cannot happen. So I'd like to adopt a both and strategy and support the jumpstart bill and to also lend my voice to defunding the Seattle Police Department. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. Looking forward to visiting you there again soon. Robert Cruz, welcome. Thank you, Council President. My name is Robert Cruz and I live and represent business in CM Juarez as District 5. Pollution, climate change, COVID, and gentrification of marginalized black and brown communities. Black Lives Matter means to meet centuries of inequity with economic justice. I want you to commit to generating $500 million to these ends through Swap Morales' tax Amazon legislation and by defunding SPD by at least half and put it towards programs that support black and brown empowerment instead of black and brown oppression. You need to fund our communities in a big way and Councilmember Mosqueda's jumpstart proposal falls short of this kind of permanent action needed to address the intersections of racism and profit that affect Seattle and the world. A billionaire class built on systemic inequity should help address systemic inequity permanently. We need COVID relief, a Green New Deal, jobs, and affordable housing before 2022. We don't have the time to continually delay this actual Amazon web service likely in terms of profit from this very Zoom call. Defund oppression, tax profiteers, justice for communities on the planet immediately because the future is now. Black Lives Matter and I yield my time. MacArthur, Emily, welcome. Hi, I'm a District 2 renter, uh, and I would love to believe in what the speaker right before or previous said that this could be a yes and strategy. I would love to see there be $700 million uh, in uh, annual 
funding for community programs. Unfortunately, I do think that the Jumpstart uh, proposal is meant to be uh, an instead and a distraction, and that's why I'm speaking in favor of the Amazon tax as proposed by Sawant and Morales. We need $500 million a year. Um, you know, I uh, think that $200 million is less than half, and less than half cannot cover more programs. Any working-class family can tell you that you can't take less money and make it go further. Uh, of, of course, also, I absolutely reject a sunset clause. Um, we need a sunset on the status quo. We need a sunset on uh, homelessness. We need a sunset on, um, you know, systemic inequality and racism. We do not need a, a sunset business tax. Um, big business can pay and they should invest in our communities now. Thank you. Kyra Miko, followed by Mariah Mitchell and Julia Zaglin. Um, Kira, are you with us? Yeah, thank you. Um, my name is Kira. I'm a D3 resident and a volunteer with the Tax Amazon Coalition. Um, I've spent the last two months collecting signatures for I-131, um, which is a ballot initiative similar to the Sawant and Morales bill. Um, and I'm calling to ask Council Member Mosqueda, why are you proposing a different bill um, that raises uh, less than half the revenue and has a sunset clause, um, especially when 15,000 Seattle residents have already indicated their support for the tax Amazon? Um, in fact, the biggest question people have asked me while I've been gathering signatures is why aren't we proposing a bigger tax? Um, and finally, I want to ask, why are you inviting executives from Expedia and other big businesses to come to the table when Seattle clearly denounced how corporations influence our city's politics um, in last November's election? I urge the city council um, to pass the Swanton and Morales Amazon tax as a start. Um, and I also uh, equivocally, unequivocally support uh, defunding the Seattle police by 50%. Thank you. Thank you. Mariah Mitchell, welcome. Uh, I am here in support of the tax Amazon and also defending the Seattle police. Um, a 911 call goes out and the North Precinct responds. When the North Precinct responds, they go to a door, knock on the door. A pregnant woman opens the door with four small children behind her. A scuffle ensures there's no body cams, there's no tear gas, there's no rubber bullets, there's no taser, there's nothing. There's an automatic uh, weapon that loads five to seven bullets into her chest, and luckily none of them went through her pregnancy body and hit any of the four children behind her. The four children behind her are Jazzy, Quan, um, Zalea, and Zayante, and now they have no mother. And those two police officers from the North Precinct do not get charged with murder. They are acquitted of all charges. For that reason alone, you should defund the police by 100% or hold them accountable for murder. Thank you very much for that testimony and for continuing to lift up that, that story and that example of why we are working to defund the police. Thank you so much. Uh, Julia Zaglin. Hi, my name is Julia Zaglin. I'd like you to say her name. Her name is Charlena Lyles. I'm your local unemployed bartender, a District 6 resident. I've been following these budget meetings and I am disappointed. Why look at other cities when your citizens are crying out for you? You all look tone deaf. The budget or jumpstart proposals or all of this is not going to slow any movement outside or clear your inboxes and voicemails. You are not doing nearly enough. We want you to defund the police by at least 50%. Stop pretending to fund affordable housing. Stop gentrifying the CD right now. Listen to community members and start focus, stop focusing on red tape. Fund anti-gentrification land acquisition now. Stop predatory landing. And redistribute at least half of SPD's budget or all of the, the next death by SPD hands will be the blood on yours. I yield my time. Council colleagues, we have um, gone 20, over 20 minutes. I'm gonna extend public comment for another uh, 10 minutes and try and get as many people in as we can. Is there any objection? Hearing no objection, we'll continue with public comment. The next three people are Deepa Sivaran, Hannah um, Swaboda, and Kate Simpson. Deepa, are you with us? Hi, my name is Deepa Sivarajan. I'm a member of the uh, Seattle LGBTQ Commission and the Parks District Oversight Committee, but today I'm speaking for the Coalition of Seattle Indian Americans. Please vote for the tax Amazon proposal from Council Members Sawant and Morales, which will permanently raise at least $500 million per year from big businesses. 
This is the minimum amount of money needed to permanently fund affordable housing, services in low-income communities, COVID relief, and the Green New Deal. A proposal that generates less revenue or includes a sunset clause is insufficient. We also support the demands of the King County Equity Now Coalition, including defunding the Seattle Police Department by at least $180 million to invest in the Black community. These sources of funding should also provide for a $500 million anti-gentrification land acquisition fund to help the Black community acquire property in the central area and support Black economic development and the other demands made by the coalition. If you believe that Black Lives Matter, put your money where your mouth is and support both King County Equity Now and Tax Amazon. Thank you. Thank you. Hannah, are you with us? Hi, my name is Hannah Swoboda, and I'm also calling in to voice support for council members who want tax Amazon legislation. I think it totally shows the strength of our movement that council member Mosqueda was pressured to bring forward her own proposal to tax business. But unfortunately, Mosqueda's proposal, which is a deal struck with big business, totally falls short of what we need. Mosqueda's proposal would raise less than half of the money that the Sawant Morales tax Amazon legislation would raise. I think it's outrageous that the Mosqueda bill has a sunset clause, as if after 10 years, our housing and homelessness crisis would simply disappear. We need to do better than that. We can't settle for a watered-down big business tax. Mosqueda, why make deals with big business? Why don't you instead work with ordinary people who are trying to address our affordable crisis um, of housing instead? We need to permanently raise at least $500 million a year and pass the Sawant Morales Tax Amazon bill. Um, we also need to defund SPD by at least 50%. Thank you. Katie Simpson? Kate Simpson? My name is Kate Simpson, and I'm a resident of Capitol Hill. I am calling in support of defunding the SPD by at least 50% and using the money to invest in community and restorative justice. The police presence in my neighborhood do not make me feel safe, and since reclaiming the East Precinct, my area feels much safer. The East Precinct must be turned over to black and, black and brown community leaders so it can actually help Seattle residents. Furthermore, I demand an independently elected community oversight board with full powers over police, including hiring and firing. The protesters that have been arrested must also be freed and all charges against them dropped. I'm also in favor of tax Amazon. It would help repair racist gentrification by building affordable housing, and it would also provide green jobs. Thank you. I yield my time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Billy Lee Ballard. Hello, good morning. Thank you for taking my comment. I'm Billy Lee Ballard and I live in Queen Anne. I'm calling about agenda item two, the alternative models of public facing. Disabled individuals make up the majority of those killed in use of force cases by police officers. We also know that the majority of those killed in use of force cases are black, indigenous, and people of color. Addressing ableism is key to dismantling systemic racism in an institution that has prematurely terminated lives. From Eddie Gray, who suffered from lead poisoning, to John Williams, a deaf wood carver shot by Seattle police in 2010, to individuals to get tipped out of their wheelchairs by police, to those dealing with mental illness. I ask city council to please keep people with disabilities, especially black, indigenous, and people of color, front and center when restructuring the Seattle Police Department budget. Sources are Ruderman Family Foundation reports, years 2016 to 2017. Thank you. Thank you very much. Addie Smith, welcome. Hi, my name is Addie Smith. I am a black woman, registered voter, and hate crime survivor. I am calling to ask the council to vote in support of defunding the police by at least 50%, including community responders for non-criminal emergency calls. As well, this council should support the measure to tax Amazon to address racist gentrification and fund social housing jobs and the Green New Deal. I'm also demanding that Governor Inslee order an investigation into hate crimes committed against black women on Mercer Island. Their voices are being suppressed by Mayor Benson Wong, Mercer Island City Council, and Mercer Island City Attorney, and multi-million dollar property management and development companies, Legacy Partners, Attorneys Puckett and Redford, Stoll Reeves, Bauer Pittman Snyder Huff, Lifetime Legal. Black women are not safe on Mercer Island. Black women are not safe in Washington State, and I yield the remainder of my time. Thank you very much. 
Pedro Espinosa, followed by Daniel Wang, Susan Health, and Jeffrey Snyder. Pedro, welcome. Thank you, Council Member uh, Mosqueda, and thank you, Council Members, for allowing me the time to speak. Uh, my name is Pedro Espinosa. I, I, I am a representative of the Carpenters Union, and I am calling in full support of uh, Teresa Mosqueda's uh, uh, Revenue Jumpstart Seattle. I think it's a, a bill that would really target not only just Amazon, but all corporations that are here profiting on the backs of people. And also, I'm in support that the bill also allows us to uh, get work for the communities uh, of color, minorities, uh, immigrant people that should be covered, um, as well as providing uh, uh, jobs that uh, will promote the growth of communities of color and indigenous and immigrant uh, communities. This, by allowing this to uh, pay prevailing wages on jobs for Seattle housing, I think move. I, and I just want to thank the, the board for allowing me to talk. Thank you. Pedro, thank you so much for calling in today. Daniel Wang. Hi, I'm a student in District 4 and a volunteer with the Tax Amazon Movement. In the wake of the COVID-19 recession and plummeting tax revenues, I joined many others in calling to defund the SBD by 50% instead of making austerity budget cuts to social services. But frankly, we're going to need a lot more money than just half the police budget. We needed COVID-19 emergency relief, and we needed to fund affordable housing yesterday. I am glad to see that Councilmember Muscada has also put forward her own Jumpstart Seattle proposal, as any additional source of progressive revenue is welcome. Like others have said, I'd love to see both Jumpstart and the Amazon tax passed. However, I cannot support Muscada's proposal if it moves to replace the Sawa Morales tax. Its sunset clause and its very name implies that this is a response to a temporary problem. But Seattle's housing crisis and absurdly regressive tax structure existed long before COVID-19, and these will continue to plague the people of Seattle long after COVID-19 if a $200 million tax with a sunset clause ends up being the boldest legislation we can pass. We need a permanent big business tax now. Thank you. I yield my time. Thank you for calling in. Susan Health. Hello, my name is Susan Health. I'm a resident of the 6th District, a retired UW lecturer, a member of Transit Riders Union, and a volunteer on the Tax Amazon campaign. I 100% support uh, the uh, Sawant Morales proposal as well as defunding the police. The Mosqueda proposal is uh, someone called it a capitalistic fig leaf. It is a, a cynical, short-term measure that will plug holes in the budget but do nothing to address the horrendous housing uh, emergency that we have. It will build what, 91 units of low-income housing. The, the, the original tax Amazon proposal will build more than 10,000 units over the next 10 years. This is completely inadequate. It's backroom dealings with corporations. I don't know why the council wants to do this. You, you, the last election showed that the Seattle City voters do not want Amazon corporate tools. So please fund uh, please vote for the tax Amazon and uh, proposal and defund the police. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Jeffrey Snyder, followed by Laura Lowe Bernstein and Barbara Finney. And the last speaker will be Tristan Spears. I apologize for folks who might have signed up and waited to testify. We really do have to cut it off at this point, and we will have public testimony again today at 2 p.m. Jeffrey Snyder, welcome. Hello, Councilmember Mosqueda. I'd really like to congratulate you on the breadth of the coalition you've put together to support your new Jumpstart Seattle legislation. However, I think it really doesn't go nearly far enough. Seattle's facing a budget shortfall this year of 210 to $300 million and compromising away $300 million and not even getting corporations like Expedia on board, I think indicates that compromise is not the path forward here. I'd also like to support the demands to defund SPD by 50% to reinvest that money in the black community in the central district and to free all those arrested while protesting without charges. I don't want a year-long process that produces a long list of recommendations that are not followed. I see you all hoping this is going to blow over and everything will go back to normal, but I don't want normal. Normal means SPD killing our black and indigenous neighbors like Charlena Lyles, Jay Taylor, and John C. Williams. Normal means constant harassment of the homeless for being unable to afford housing. Normal means a police department that has all but declared war on the citizens of this city. You have the power of legislation and the power of the budget. Please stop pretending you need more time or don't have the tools. Take action now. Captain Members Morales and Swan, you continue to amaze me and inspire me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeffrey. Laura Lowe, welcome. Hello, Council. I'm calling today on behalf of Share the City, the Seattle-based organizing collective. We support the Jumpstart Seattle plan. We feel this is the absolute bare minimum that needs to be done 
to support Seattleites during this health and economic crisis. The tax Amazon legislation has not received unanimous enthusiastic support in our group, but this plan does. Anyone opposing the Jumpstart Seattle plan is revealing a deep level of disconnect they have towards our economic crisis and people suffering. It is our understanding that Mayor Durkin won't be able to veto the Jumpstart Seattle plan. The urgency of this moment is directly tied to the fact that we will have a historic eviction crisis in March, and with that, a sharp rise in homelessness. We don't have the solutions to meet our current needs due to lack of funding, income inequality, and restrictive class of zoning. We want to recognize that this is a start. It's just a jump start. It doesn't come anywhere meeting the needs of our crisis. Also, please stop the sweep to fund SPD and meet the demands of King County Equity Now. Thank you. Laura, thank you so much. Barbara Finney. I'm Barbara Finney from G5, a member of AFGE, a delegate to the MLK Labor Council, a member of the 32nd Legislative District Democrats. I'm calling in support of defund SPD by 50% at least and tax Amazon. Charlena Lyles was murdered in her home in front of her children by Seattle police three years ago tomorrow. Say her name. Defund SPD by at least 50% now and put that funding into black and brown people's restorative funding. Last night, the 43rd LD Democrats joined the 32nd LD Democrats and King County Democrats in endorsing the Swamp Morales-sponsored legislation to tax big business and build massive social housing, and also endorsing Initiative 131, Tax Amazon and Seattle Big Businesses. Provide, to provide COVID-19 relief and build social housing fund, Green New Deal, massive jobs. Thank you, Barbara. And our last speaker today is Tristan Spears. Thank you for the time. Um, Miss, I would just have to say that the last time I sat next to you, Miss Mosqueda, I was right there beside you about a year ago, standing up for your sustaining, st stabilizing Seattle's workers' rights. Um, since then, I'm pretty sure that you had your kid and congratulations. But just to state that what you're doing to my community by trying to put a sun, sunset on what we need right now at this very moment for our sustainability, for our future practices to be able to be have right in our community to be heard, is like putting a sun cap, sunrise on, and a cap on your child's future as well. Because that's what you're telling my community by telling us that we don't, we don't, we don't need what we, we don't deserve what we need. And I had a speech rolling at this point in time, but this is just coming from the heart at this point because my grandmother's church in the Central District where my parents are married, I'll never be able to go there again because it's gone. You know, my community does not have nothing in our city, and we demand to have something. So before I go back to leading my marches, I just want this to be known that Black Lives Matter, Charlene Lyles matters, and we're here, and we're not going to be silent. So I hope that you hear my community, and I hope that you remember the passion I have for it and the drive behind it because we're not going to deal with the sunset. You can sunset your career later if you think that we're going to take Okay, council colleagues, uh, there's one person that we missed, um, and I promised to get back to that. Um, Allison Eisinger, number 21 for IT staff. She is present. IT, let me know if you are able to get her in. And then I'm just looking at the list here to see if we missed anybody else. I don't see Allison on the call at the moment. Okay. All right, then at this point, um, council members, thank you so much for your flexibility here. Um, to all the people who've called in, we really appreciate it. I think that, um, you know, we are still dealing with the IT system here, and I know we've been getting messages about people who uh, want to testify. There will be ample opportunity to testify each day at the beginning of the meeting, and we will try to provide as much time as possible so that um, we can get as many people in, and uh, you have our commitment, my commitment, that we're going to have robust public testimony at each meeting at the very beginning. At this time, um, I want to thank everybody who dialed in. Please do send us an email or a call um, or dial in to testify again, either this afternoon or every Wednesday at 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. is when we will have our meetings. Moving on to items of business, um, item number one, will the clerk please call the roll? 
I mean, will the clerk please read into the record item number one? Agenda item one, progressive revenue strategies for discussion. Thank you. Council colleagues, I wanna thank everybody for being with us here today as we have been talking over the last week or so about regenerating our conversation around progressive revenue. I've had the chance to check in with the sponsors of the um, proposals that we had heard about um, a month ago and last week as well um, in an effort to make sure that we had a robust dialogue about progressive revenue as a entire concept. We have included um, both items on our agenda today as background documents. Today, we will have the opportunity to hear from central staff who have provided us with some briefing materials. Presenters include Dan Eater, Tom Mikesell, Ali Panucci, and Tracy Ratcliffe, um, who will be able to walk through with us the proposal that um, I shared with you yesterday, the Jumpstart Seattle proposal, as I, so, as I mentioned earlier, is how I'm shorthanding it. And we will have an opportunity to make sure that everybody has a solid understanding or solid um, grounding on that proposal as well. I wanna thank council member Sawant and council member Morales for putting out their proposal. I would also note that the earlier proposal um, before COVID uh, was a really helpful foundation for our conversation as well. Uh, during the last legislative session, we also heard a lot of discussion about the need to raise revenue through representative Macri's bill. Um, that was advancing during the legislative session and did not move out of the legislative body. That said, a lot of really important work was done to look at high income earners on the large, in the largest corporations. Um, I wanna thank uh, Senator Nguyen as well, who had a, a bill in the Senate um, that will potentially come back next year. But, but the conversation I think has underscored that we need to act locally when we see the state not able to necessarily pass revenue right now and not just the historic dramatic decrease in funding that we needed for community prior to COVID, but the crisis that is COVID is presenting an even more stark reality. Um, fissures in our system are exposing how many people are being left behind in the current economy and our need to invest in our community, both small businesses, creating food assistance, creating housing assistance, and making sure that we're providing support for immigrants and refugees who've been left out of federal assistance means we need to act now with urgency. The state legislature may reconvene a special session soon, but we don't have a lot of um, indication that they will be taking up progressive revenue at this point. So to, um, to us falls the responsibility to step up and make sure that there's sufficient revenue. Appreciate the conversations that I've had with council member Sawant and Morales about their bill. Um, and we will continue to keep the conversations open uh, for today. We wanna make sure folks have a, a grounding of what the, is included in the proposal that I outlined yesterday. So in the spirit of dialogue and discussion, um, I'm gonna turn it over to our central staff to walk us through some presentations that they have provided for us and looking forward to a robust discussion today from our council colleagues. Thank you so much. Uh, Dan Eater, Tom Mikesell, Ali Panucci, Tracy Ratscliffe. I'll turn it over to you. I believe you have some materials to share with us via Zoom and presentations for the general viewing public. If you want to take over the presentation and share those screens, that would be welcome. Okay, council member, uh, I'm doing that presently. Uh, and Ali Panucci, uh, Tracy Ratscliffe and Tom Mikesell will take over the presentation. Thanks, Dan. As Dan's getting the PowerPoint um, set up, I'll just briefly go over um, what we'll walk through today and then begin the discussion of the proposed spending. So uh, good morning, council members. Today, we'll provide an overview of Chair Mosqueda's payroll tax package. Tracy and I will first go over the proposed spending in 2020 and the spending plan for future years. And then Tom will walk through the proposed payroll expense tax. Next slide, uh, or excuse me, two slides. Um, the spending plan will be reflected in two separate pieces of legislation. The first bill authorizes spending and places a proviso on funds to guide the use of those funds in 2020. The second piece of legislation establishes a spending plan for the new tax starting in 2021 and establishes a payroll tax oversight committee. Next slide, please. The first piece of legislation would authorize spending from the city's emergency and reserve funds in 2020 to provide assistance to low-income individuals, workers, and businesses impacted by the COVID-19 crisis. 
This includes $18 million to support businesses and family child care providers, $36 million for housing security and services, $18 million to support immigrant and refugee communities, and $16 million for food security programs. These next two slides provide more details on each of the areas where spending would be authorized in 2020. For small business support, about 4% or $3.6 million would provide grants to about 30, excuse me, 340 family child care providers. That's um, grants of about $10,000 per child care provider. And about 16% of the funds or 14.1 million would provide $10,000 grants to about 1,300 small businesses and would provide about $300,000 to support programs and that provide technical assistance and training for small businesses. This support for businesses is intended to help protect jobs and moderate the impacts to the local tax revenue by supporting the continued operations of small businesses, supporting childcare facilities so workers have access to childcare as they return to work, and support changes um, and support investments in businesses that need to modify their physical layouts to comply with public health guidance or um, obtain additional supplies. The $36 million for investments in housing programs will provide about $19 million for rental assistance programs, such as the United Way of King County's home-based programs and homeless prevention programs. This could provide three months of rental assistance to about 3,300 households, if you assume uh, average rent of about $1,900 per month. $11 million would fund shelter de-intensification efforts and support investments in other ha housing and shelter options. This could include leasing hotel rooms, expanding or increasing support for tiny home villages and helping um, shelters uh, modify their business practices. $1 million would also be provided for foreclosure prevention programs. This could support programs that provide mortgage counseling services and provide direct mortgage assistance of uh, about $30,000 per household to up to 35 households. And then $5 million would be provided to support the ongoing service and operation costs for affordable housing providers and shelter providers who have seen their costs increase as they modify the pro their provision of services to reflect public health guidance. About $1 million um, would be used to support programs that provide language access to support um, immigrant and refugee communities who need help accessing and understanding federal, state, and local assistance programs. And about $17 million would provide direct financial assistance to Seattle's low-income immigrant and refugee workers and households who have experienced the economic impacts caused by the COVID-19 crisis. This could be used to provide $1,000 per household and direct financial assistance to about 16,000 immigrant and refugee workers and households. This funding is intended to prioritize support for workers and households who are ineligible for other federal or state emergency assistance or may receive such assistance, but it's limited or, or, it, or the delay may not be meeting their current needs. And for those who have had their own families impacted um, by the COVID-19 crisis um, and help them address the health care needs. $14 million would be used to expand the emergency grocery voucher program that the city launched early in the COVID-19 crisis. This funding could expand or extend that program to provide two months of grocery vouchers to about 16,000 households, assuming uh, a per month voucher of $400. So moving on next to um, the, the second piece of legislation um, that outlines the intended spending in 2021 and then in 2022 and beyond, um, I'll first describe what is planned for 2021. In 2021, the revenue estimate from the new payroll tax is about $174 million. Tom will describe that in more detail later in the presentation. Um, the bill first outlines the intended use of that estimated revenue for 2021. So it would first spend about half of the estimated revenue or $86 million to replenish the emergency and reserve funds that were used to support the investments in 2020 to address the COVID-19 crisis. Of the remaining half, 75% would be used to provide continuity of services and programs administered for programs and services administered or supported by the city that prior to the COVID-19 crisis that absent the support from this new payroll tax would see a reduction in funding. This could include, for example, 
um, if short-term rental revenues continue to come in below what was anticipated, if funding to support the ongoing service and operation costs for our permanent supportive housing developments, and funding to support the city's equitable development initiative. In addition, if general fund revenues continue to decrease, funding for a wide variety of programs and services that the council has in previous, previous budgets ensured there is funding for may see reductions or be eliminated if revenues continue to decline. So this funding could support the ongoing investments in those programs. And then 20 percent um, would be used to support some of the programs funded in 2020 to address the ongoing economic impacts of COVID-19. And 5% would be provided for the departments and community-based organizations to administer these programs. The council will authorize the specific spending plan for these funds as part of the annual budget adoption process this slide, um, excuse me, this fall. And with that, I will turn it over to Tracy who will walk through the proposal for 2022 and beyond. Thank you, Ali. So I'm moving to slide seven uh, and the proposed spending plan for 2022 and beyond. As you can see, 65% of the revenue would be uh, used for the construction or acquisition of affordable housing for uh, serving households with incomes between zero and 50% of uh, area median income. It would also cover ongoing operating and services costs for housing serving households from zero to 30% of AMI. And then finally, it could also cover the associated costs, infrastructure costs, such as energy efficiency upgrades and appliances and so forth that might go along with the construction of new rental projects. This funding will be prioritized for housing that serves households from zero to 30% of AMI. 10% of the uh, revenue will support equitable development initiative projects, including the housing and non-housing components of such projects. 20% of the revenue will support local businesses and tourism to spur the local economic recovery and to provide workforce stability. And then finally, 5% of the revenue will support startup and administrative costs. An implementation plan developed by the executive in cooperation with the council will include more specifics on the spending for 2022 and beyond. The legislation directs the executive to submit this plan to the council no later than January or June 30th, 2021. A racial equity analysis is be, to be completed by the executive with support from the Office of Civil Rights um, on the plan before it is submitted to the council. The um, new, uh, the legislation does establish a new uh, nine member payroll tax oversight committee um, that will be appointed by the council and the mayor. As you can see, the committee will include representatives from city staff, labor, business, community organizations, and communities that will benefit from the proposed spending. The committee will provide oversight on the services and programs supported by the payroll tax and the impacts of this tax on the number of jobs and businesses in the city and other data that directly relates to measuring the impact of this tax on the city's economy. The committee will provide an annual report to the council and the mayor. Allie and I would be happy to answer any questions that you might have about the spending uh, ordinances. Okay, thank you so much, council colleagues. I would love to hear your thoughts and feedback. I know that's a lot of information. I'm trying to scroll through because it's a little challenge to see everybody um, with the shared screen. So give me one second here. There we go, now I can see all of you. Um, I wanna also offer that the spend plan has been sort of dissected into a narrative document that I have um, attempted to draft and share with you. We will share that more publicly when we get a chance to make sure that all the typos are fixed. But in an effort to try to provide a little bit of a story or a narrative to how these dollars could get out the door, uh, you do have a draft that I sent you this morning and we'll be happy to share that with um, obviously members of the media and the public as soon as we make sure to get those typos out of there. Um, one of the things that I would note is, um, you know, we, de we, did, um, we did have, I think, a call to action. I appreciate the council members, Council Member Swant and Morales who have done that from within. And then from out, we've had a call to action to support people, both immigrants and refugees who've been left out of federal assistance, um, recognizing that our food assistance program wasn't going far enough, um, a recognition that the housing assistance and the voucher um, assistance that both the city and the county was trying to get out the door was in nowhere ne was nowhere near meeting the need that we had, and recognizing for small businesses that the support that the feds have been offering through PPP first was not equitably being distributed. We know that nine out of ten small businesses who are black owned 
were denied access to PPP for the loans $20,000 and less because of the institutionalized racism that continues to perpetuate in our um, lending system. There is a huge need from the smallest businesses who are brick and mortar, who've had to close their doors and board their windows in the time of COVID as they waited to open their doors. They haven't been able to generate profit. They have been in a situation where their employees are not able to work from home. And we did reach out to uh, businesses and ask, what does this system look like in a post COVID world to get a better sense of where we could draw the line. Um, this does build on some really good work that had been done both at the state and, and at the city level. And it applies an analysis of saying, um, you know, where do those dollars go in a post COVID world? What we heard was people need flexible dollars. There's not enough flexible dollars from the feds because the PPP dollars for local businesses require people to bring their staff back at full capacity when those small businesses can't even open restaurants at full capacity. Restaurant owners and small businesses have said that they need flexible dollars to hire people, but they also need to, you know, renovate their small um, establishments and put in safety protections by cleaning equipment, put in plexiglass, what have you. And then lastly, we heard overwhelmingly, and I think this is a shared priority among the council, um, as schools are closed, they themselves as business owners or the employees that um, want to go back to work, in a safe way, there is no place for their kiddos to go with schools closed and summer programs closed. So really uh, working with SEIU 925 to try to figure out a child care assistance program specifically for those um, small business workers. Um, so that is a, a little bit of a context on why um, why there is such a long list of um, folks who are supporting this from the business community because I think it was important to ask what do the small businesses need. I think that they all want just progressive revenue and in conversations with um, Councilmember Sawant and Councilmember Morales, I think I've continued to identify the three pillars that really unite us. One is hundreds of millions of dollars in progressive revenue. Two is making sure the assessment is truly progressive that we can assess those who are doing well in a post COVID world and being realistic about um, the dollar amount that we bring in and, and you know, investing in those who've been left behind. And three, making sure it was actionable, making sure that there was dollars that we could book right now to make sure that there was assistance that could get out the door. I'm hopeful that those three pillars that I think unite us all on council and especially among the sponsors of the legislation continue to get lift up, lifted up because I do think that there's a lot of um, uh, commonality in, in why a progressive revenue proposal is being put forward from folks here and the urgency to make sure that something happens. So with that, I wanna thank folks for from central staff specifically for providing this level of detail for us. Um, please do know that there's more detail behind each of these slides, including in that narrative document that I sent you and even more behind that in the Excel document. So let's get to some questions on the spend plan before we get to the tax side. Yes, council member Lewis. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you for bringing this forward for the consideration of the Council. And, um, you know, I do have uh, some questions based on the central staff presentation, um, and I'll, I'll leave it open to who on the panel wants to respond. Um, my first one would be um, as to the services spend, um, particularly as to uh, the child care, food access, and rent subsidy. Am, am I correct that all of that would be um, uh, new and additional spending to meet the um, increased demand that we're seeing due to COVID. That's not to, uh, to sort of plug um, existing services, but rather to expand because we know that uh, th those are, are currently being stretched their capacity. Um, is that a correct read of that? Uh, Council Member Lewis, yes, um, that is a correct read. In, in most cases, these are either new or expanding existing sort of programs that provide assistance to, um, you know, food food programs and, and that sort of thing. I would say the one place where um, it may be sort of supporting existing services is in the one light item that provides um, service and operation costs to nonprofit affordable housing and shelter providers. That may in fact be supporting um, providers that the city has already funded, but um, would actually support their increased costs that they've incurred because of COVID-19. So is new unanticipated spending from when the council adopted the budget last fall, but it's sort of existing services. Um, yeah. 
Uh, thank you. And on the homelessness prevention programs and rental assistance, the 19 million that is there, um, do we have any indication on the number of um, increased placements that could possibly lead to um, beyond what we currently have now, be it um, hotel rooms, be it tiny house villages, um, but additional placements uh, in the short term uh, that can help provide um, uh, safe places to get folks off the streets, get them inside and, and have them be in a place where they can socially distance. Sure. Um, so it's a little difficult to provide a really like concrete number because it will depend on specifically like a hotel room is really different than a tiny home and that sort of thing. If, if all of the $11 million was used, for example, to create tiny homes, it could uh, new tiny home villages, it could support potentially about four to six or five to seven um, new new villages with about 40 tiny homes per um Per village, but that's a you know that's a rough estimate, and the specific dollars really depend on the context. So it could provide support for a variety of services. So it's hard to say it will provide housing or shelter options to X number of individuals. Um, right, but based on the estimate you just gave, would it would it be accurate to say we're talking about um, like hundreds of new units potentially? Yeah, if you assumed four new villages, like. To be conservative as I would prefer um, <laughs> uh, of 40 tiny homes each yeah that math is you know a, a couple hundred potentially and then but it may also support if housing if shelter providers have been using hotel rooms for example um, at, to address shelter de-intensification efforts it may in fact be providing ongoing funding for people who are currently living in, in hotel rooms so it might help um, both expand the number of rooms for lack of a better word available to people experiencing homelessness and or um, help address um, not having to displace those people in two months because funding has run out um so moving to the the next question i have here the one million in mortgage counseling and foreclosure um, prevention that's uh, penciled in here at one million what does that look like programmatically that's that's certainly something I've been hearing a lot of concern from constituents about, but it, it seems like, um, uh, you know, yeah, I haven't really known as a council member what the levers are for um, us to get more involved in that. So I'm just curious uh, what, you know, how that would be implemented. So we already have the mortgage counseling and foreclosure prevention program. Uh, we actually started it with the 2016 levy. Um, we actually didn't see very much use until, as you might imagine, uh, in the last few months. Um, so we actually have a program that exists with program guidelines and we kind of modeled the number of potential households we could serve based on that model. This one, uh, that model might be tweaked a little bit because what we're hearing is what, that the folks may actually be able to negotiate with their lenders a modified uh, mortgage amount. What they really need is the people who can help them do those negotiations. So we might be looking at putting a little more money into actual counseling services versus what this could also fund is the actual loans that folks might need, mortgage uh, assistance, temporary mortgage payments that they might need. Um, that that will all get sorted out in the uh, coming months in terms of what that program structure might actually look like. But those are a couple of things that we've heard about how that money could be used, not dissimilar to the program that we have uh, currently. Yeah, Tracy, I, I'd appreciate maybe um, uh, if we could arrange a time to go more in depth into that, because that sounds really interesting, especially the, the kind of programmatic expansions you just kind of foreshadowed. So I'd like to certainly learn more about that offline. Um, and then this last question uh, that I have, and, and then I can turn it back over, Madam Chair, uh, about the uh, the 86 million in the reserves. Um, is, is it a correct understanding that um, an advantage that the jumpstart plan would have over, say, like another balancing strategy would be um, uh, that instead of spending down the reserves and then having to replenish it later through, I mean, I would imagine over time through the general fund, um, but that's another thing that, that you could um, correct me on, that that money um, being immediately replenished uh, through uh, this jumpstart program would uh, would help to safeguard um, that fund in case 
uh, we we should have cause for, you know, 2020 is not over yet, uh, if we should have cause to respond to another emergency or revenue stabilization situation, um, would that be an advantage over, uh, over a, a balancing strategy where instead we would spend that account down with the assumption that over the next like decade, we would replenish it through general fund appropriations? Um, did someone want to take that on? Uh I'll, I'll give it a shot and um, Dan or Tom may want to, to weigh in more, but I, I think that um, in, a, in a general sense, yes, I think having a um, planned for a new revenue source to immediately replenish the funds just provides a little bit more security to the city um, if there is uh, other emergencies and or, um, you know, it's quite possible that with the, these uh, economic impacts impacts will persist and the revenue shortfalls will persist into 2021 and, and beyond. And so it may be that next year the council decides that um, you're going to replenish half of it and you're going to need to continue to provide some emergency assistance. But yes, having, I think, a new revenue source to replenish those funds versus assuming that revenues will increase over the years and we will slowly rebuild those funds is um, uh, you know, it's it, it provides more certainty. So in the event that our spending, uh, the spending plan came in under, right? Like if we, if Jumpstart raised less money, there's sort of less risk from this approach because we're sort of already intending to spend down our rainy day accounts to meet um, the current needs. So um, like we wouldn't be putting other potential funds at risk because we would just be doing what we'd be doing anyway, get, kind of replenishing those funds through the general fund. Like, is that one way to understand it or am I making it too complicated? Um, well, I don't, I don't know if I totally understand um, the question. If revenues come in less than the estimate, um, they'll, I mean, it's sort of uh, uh, similar to what we're about to undertake when the mayor transmit, transmits the rebalancing package, uh, appropriation decisions would have to be modified, you know, how, where you're authorizing spending would have to be modified to reflect that. And council would have the choice of potentially reducing how much they you are putting back into those emergency and rainy day funds um, versus direct you know direct spending in 2021. And it looks like maybe Dan has some um, something to add here. Yeah, the only other thought that I layer in is that um, this is uh, this amounts to a a plan that it doesn't itself. Um, effectuate the funding or refunding of the emergency reserves, that decision would be made um, more uh, specifically in the fall budget process when the council has additional information um, about the, uh, the, the needs of the city as a whole, the, uh, the revenue picture looking forward and um, can balance uh, competing priorities. Um, this is uh, this is a plan that would certainly inform and um, and would be used as a guide for those future decisions. But the decision itself isn't being made in this legislation so much as an announcement that this is what the council currently thinks um, its decision will be when the budget is uh, the fall budget season comes. Yeah, and maybe Thank to you put, so a, much. put a finer point on that as an example, you know. Um, the, the plan, it says that about $65 million would be spent to, to support on the ongoing programs and services that might otherwise see a cut because of reduced revenues. If during the fall budget process, um, the council finds that there's a much bigger gap in order to maintain programs that are essential um, and a priority for council members, you might decide to provide a little bit more, you know, 80% of the money for continuity of services and put, you know, $75,000 back in the emergency fund. So there'll, there'll be some, some balancing, but you will actually authorize the spending um, during the fall budget process. Thank you, Council Member Lewis. Um, and we're happy to circle back to you. Council Member Herbal, then, then Council Member Sawant. Council Member Herbal. Thank you. Um, so I have, um, questions across a couple different slides um, I think staying on this slide for now is good uh, for my questions so um, it looks like uh, since we're using the 
Revenue Stabilization Fund and the Emergency uh, Sub Fund. Um, we will not need uh, to do an inner fund loan, uh, taking um, uh, loaning ourselves funds from the various uh, voter approved levies, the housing levy, the parks levy, the transportation levy um, that had been originally considered, which allows, as I understand it, if that is correct, that allows for the executive to, um, in its rebalancing package, um, to uh, use some of those funds. Um, as we've heard from the, um, the budget director, Dr. Uh, ben Noble, that they intended to do, they intended to use um, some, um, some revenue associated with those levies for the rebalancing package. So as I understand this proposal, we're not dipping into those dollars. So that allows the executive to use them in the rebalancing package. Um, and then my second uh, uh, point, so that, that that's, I want that, conf that understanding uh, confirmed. And then my second point are, around that particular issue, I have some others as well, um, relates specifically to the number of dollars um, that this proposal uses from um, the, um, the rainy day fund and the uh, rate, revenue stabilization account. Um, it looks like we're using uh, 67 million and, uh, oh no, it looks like we're leaving a balance of 67 million and 61 million in both of those uh, emergency accounts. Um, have we had a conversation with the executive again about their rebalancing package? Because again, uh, my understanding is their rebalancing package uh, depends on on um, on those revenues as well, um, so just get it, trying to get a sense of whether or not, um, and you know, they, they're going to make a rebalancing package proposal to us, and and we may change it. I'm just trying to get get a sense um, of whether or not um, leaving 67 million and 61 million respectively uh, in those respectively in those two accounts um, allows them to propose a rebalancing package along the lines that they. They were considering. I also do want to flag that I have heard from Director Noble several times that he does not want to deplete those funds uh, in 2020 because he wants access to them um, uh, when the needs become greater in 2021. Um, okay, I'm going to try to walk through the, the, those questions, but just jump in if I'm I'm missing something. So I think as a starting point, there's about. $67 million in the emergency fund and about 60-ish million in the revenue stabilization fund. That is at, uh, based on uh, Director Noble's presentation in April, the, the, uh, uh, the current state of things. So this proposal would spend down the bulk of the emergency fund and a portion of the revenue stabilization fund. So it, it zeroes them out as opposed to, I'm sorry, thank you for that clarification. Yeah. I was thinking that uh, after this proposal, this is the balance that's left over. This proposal zeroes those funds out. I, I wanna live in that world that you just described, but yes, this proposal, <laughs> <laughs> this proposal, um, would, would wouldn't zero out both funds it would essentially zero out the emergency fund and would spend about uh 20 million dollars from the revenue stabilization fund and i'll just note that the draft legislation that was attached to um, this agenda we are still working out the details of exactly which appropriation comes out of which fund but it is about it is essentially spending what um, we understand to be the balance in the emergency fund and about 20 million of the approximately $60 million balance in the revenue stabilization fund. However, the legislation preserves options for the council to consider where to where to get this $86 million. It can be from the emergency fund, it can be from the revenue stabilization fund, and it can be from the um, general fund, including some of the um, you know other dollars that the, the city may receive to support COVID, the COVID response. We had hoped to benefit from having the mayor's proposed um, rebalancing package to understand what the best mix is, but absent having that information solidified, this puts out a proposal based on what we understand to be those balances. Um, Director Noble also mentioned a unanticipated general fund balance from 2019 of about 18 and a half million dollars, I believe um, we are assuming that will be an obvious piece of the rebalancing efforts. But until we see it, 
um, it's difficult to say exactly what the right split is, but there will be some choices for the council to make uh, based on what the mayor proposes, both to rebalance and continue to, to pay for services and programs that were funded in the adopted budget, as well as COVID response. And so we'll work with the, the sponsor and also the budget chair um, to, to fine tune it, but the, the way the legislation is drafted, it pre preserves some options. Thank you. Um, so I just want to flag that um, the more we spend um, of those two emergency funds in um, 2020, um, the more quickly, uh, as I understand it from my conversations with Director Noble, the more quickly we uh, may need to consider um, city uh, service uh, or city staff layoffs and um, and and furloughs. Um, the the intent of this uh, of I think the budget director in not wanting to spend those dollars down um, is to um, is to preserve the ability to um, maintain um, uh, city city jobs in 2021. Um, if we could move on to um, slide four, uh, I have a question about the um, direct financial assistance to businesses. Um, we um, uh, consistently have the the barrier of um, providing um, direct assistance to businesses in the um, prohibition of public gift of funds. Um, the current uh, uh, business stabilization program, COVID-19 business stabilization program, and the one, and the one before that, um, the pilot that was focused on uh, addressing uh, construction impacts to, to businesses or um, short-term impacts to businesses associated um, with unanticipated events um, is structures that program so that um, it only can help people uh, who are who have um, who basically as business owners um, meet an income threshold and are a particular um, size of business, a relatively small size of business. Um, I think some of that had to do with the fact that some of those funds were CDBG funds, and those are requirements of uh, the community development block grant. But I'm just wondering if you could speak. Um, uh, as it relates on slide four to what the constraints will be um, under this proposal to provide direct assistance to, to businesses, both um, small businesses, childcare and, and nonprofits. And then the, um, I, yeah, I think that's the only question I have on that slide. And then I have one more, uh, one more question um, on a another slide. Okay, if I could, um take liberty to just first uh, respond to one of your last points related to the use of the um, emergency funds and whether or not that might impact city employment layoffs and furloughs. The, um, at least uh, my understanding of the intent here is to use those funds that avail are available now, but to replenish them immediately in 2021 to preserve use of those funds to ensure, like to, to minimize the impacts on city employment. And again, so that that's is, the 75% for 2021, correct? Well, there's 75, so there's there's about $174 million for 2021 of, of, of um, the, the revenue estimate is about 174 million. So half would go back, like would put the emergency funds back and then half would be continuity of services. So the combination of those things would allow, um, would allow the city to continue to have access to, to those funds to try to minimize impacts on city employment. And again, my understanding of council member Mosqueda's intent here is to take a, when we see the mayor's rebalancing package to take a look at what the, they're proposing to use in terms of the emergency funds and balance that with this proposal and other proposed spending for COVID relief. So I don't um, think it is accurate to say that by using these funds now that necessarily means increased city layoffs or furloughs because it is trying to to keep that money available for spending in 2021 in a variety of ways um so i just wanted to be fantastic thank you yeah yeah um, perfect okay and then in terms of your questions about providing assistance to small businesses is, that's always been a, a challenging area with the state's um, gift of public funds restrictions and those types of things so yes my understanding for the um for the um, current business stabilization fund, that criteria was um, developed based on, you know, restrictions around CDBG, but also to try to get the money to the businesses who need it most. So 
Um, this legislation defines a small business similarly as a business having five or fewer employees. There has been um, uh, interpretation or a uh, issued by the uh, state, uh, the AG's office um, that sort of provides some additional thinking around gift of public funds and supporting businesses in this moment, in this crisis. And so it will be important that the program is supporting businesses that either the business owner is low income and or the assistance will help address the economic impacts that the city is facing. And so it is a benefit to the public if this assistance helps maintain jobs and, and maintains our tax base so that we can continue to provide all of the other programs and services. So I'll distribute that um, that memo um, to, to the to council members. Thank you, I look forward to it. Um, and then my last question going to um, slide seven uh, relates to, and I'm, I apologize, you may have already covered this, but I definitely missed it. Um, can, you, can you talk about whether or not there are targets uh, built into the affordable housing number, uh, affordable housing investments? For instance, numbers of units um, that would become available to households at the targeted AMI levels. So, Councilmember, we um, the sponsor did not want to go to that level of detail because we are, you know, as you can see, several years out from that, and um, so there was a desire to um, give a little bit more thought, especially as we get a little bit closer to that. Um, this. Uh, pool of money will be um, subject to of the implementation plan that we're going to ask the executive to develop along with community, along with the council um, to make some of those determinations about the types of programs, the types of targeting that might happen, um, what income level best be served, um, and what kind of mix, you know, from PSH to just straight affordable housing um, to acquisition versus new construction. So some of those um, those decisions will be made uh, as part of that development of that implementation plan uh, for, that we will get in, in June of 2021. Thank Just you. Quick addition to that answer. Um, and then for folks who want to speak, please please raise your hand like this because I can't figure out the hand raising function on Zoom right now. I have Council Member Sawant next. Um, so if you want to speak, just raise your hand. Just a small um, addition to what Tracy said and perhaps a slight clarification. Um, I, I would like numbers, but I think it's really hard for us to put numbers um, on specific units if we don't have a sense of how much is going into permanent supportive housing versus other types of units. And I think Tracy is, I see you nodding if that's correct. Um, what I would like us to do though, is to say with the universe of dollars that we have, for example, in 2022, we could do a dissection to say within this universe of dollars, if we were to do X amount to permanent supportive housing, X amount to zero to 30% housing, housing, we could give a scenario or we can maybe give a few scenarios for how those dollars could be used if they were coupled with, um, you know, additional dollars to maybe do the operation and maintenance side. Uh, Tracy, do you want to um, work with us as we think about that? Piece? We would be happy to do that kind of scenario uh, development. We would just need to get direction from you uh, as the sponsor as to kind of what numbers you'd want to attach to the PSH only units, the number to the zero to 50 uh, and so forth. So we would be happy to do a couple of different scenarios uh, to kind of show what the potential unit production might be with those uh, different scenarios. Happy to do that. Got the cost estimates that we can uh, plug into um, uh, Excel spreadsheet to, to create those for you. And I, I will just know, I believe the one of the attachments to the agenda that was put out by your office, Council Member Mosqueda, provides a, a rough estimate of per unit cost. So if people want to just do some some division, that that the the per unit cost assumptions are included in that document, and that would that's what we would inform modeling some scenarios for you. Do you mind, Allie, if you have that document pulled up just to re reference those costs, or Tracy, you probably have them memorized as well. Um, but I, they were in that th three, uh, one pager that turned into a three pager uh, that I sent you all on Tuesday. Um, if you do have that, just to do a quick math for Councilmember Herbold and, and myself as a reminder, that would be helpful. Yeah, and I, I do think that um, we should include some of those scenarios while deferring to um, a future implementation plan um, as part of, of this package. I think that would be um, very useful for um, folks in the community who um, typically want to know what our plan is. So thank you. I don't I don't have that table in front of me. Tracy, do, do you? Okay, great. <laughs> so 
So based on the information, the most recent information we have from the Office of Housing, which is based on their FOM NOFA, we ballparked the total cost per unit at about $320,000. That is the total development cost. What the city pays or contributes to those units depends on whether it's a permanent supportive housing project versus just your kind of zero to 50% of AMI units. So what you will see in the, um, the narrative document is you'll see for permanent supportive housing, we actually presume that because we have the levy and other um, sources, primary levy being a primary source that will tap out the typical leverage that we use on permanent supportive housing that when it comes to the city's contribution towards those units, it, we presume it will be the, the entire $320,000. We have taken a slightly more um, uh, positive bent on the units that would serve up to 50% of AMI, still the total development cost being three, $320,000, but we think we may actually be able to tap some of the 4% tax credit to leverage the city's dollars and bring the city's contribution towards those, co those units down to about $170,000 per unit. Um, on the operating and services side for the permit supportive housing, I think you all know, we've talked about this a lot, the cost per unit for those permit supportive housing units is about twenty thousand dollars a year per unit so um, that would be the calculation that we would use uh, for the operating and services dollars for the, the permit supportive housing units Tracy, are you saying that there um that no other uh funding is available for permanent supportive housing other than uh housing levy dollars well not after you assume that our housing levy dollars will will in fact basically take all of the 9% tax credits that are available. We actually are doing that already. We, we, we um, get a capped limit of 9% tax credits. They're the most beneficial tax credit. We have to share it with the county. And so we have a negotiation that we have to do every year about who's gonna get how much of the 9% tax credit. And we have been tapped out every year on the 9% tax credit because there is a limited amount that we have to share with the county. There's a but I, thought, I thought the whole reason that we do combine NOFAs is because there are other, um, there are county funds and state funds and federal funds available beyond the tax credits uh, for housing development. Is that, well, in that, in that a, a typical um, housing development is a blend of uh, fund sources from, from multiple jurisdictions? You are absolutely correct, council member. There's the capital side of the equation, which there are in fact some limited dollars that come from the state through the housing trust fund, and we get some of those. Again, those are competitive dollars. Um, the county really doesn't actually have a lot of capital dollars that they contribute. Mostly what they contribute, which is not to minimize the contribution, is on the services side. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but those dollars are limited as well. So um, it's just a recognition that there, the pie of those other leveraging sources is not growing and won't grow as we exponentially increase our amounts of dollars to put into um, the production of these units, unless we can successfully get the, the federal government and the state government to give us some more resources. That is just the reality. We've talked, I think, a number of times about that when we have talked about these expanded resources that we might bring to the table, that it doesn't necessarily expand the resources from our other leveraging partners. Um, it is the reality for right now. We can hope that that might change, but it just, it, it is a reality we have to deal with. Thank you, Tracy. You're very welcome. Thank you, central staff. Um, and thank you also for maybe doing an addendum for us, a, a one pager on all of the um, information you just shared. I know we included it in our um, small document that we sent around, but having that scenario or a series of scenarios would be very helpful to break away from the alphabet soup that sometimes we swim in when we talk about housing, um, affordable housing development. Um, Councilmember Sawant, I saw your hand go up. And again, I want to thank you for um, both our conversations and also for all of your work on progressive revenue. I uh, want to make sure that folks know that all of these conversations are in the spirit of advancing progressive revenue, hundreds of millions of dollars. Appreciate your past work and uh, your ongoing work, as, as Tracy just said, for us as a city to expand the resources that we as a city can bring to the table, recognizing we need state and we need federal dollars um, and local dollars too. So thank you, Councilmember Swant, your turn. Thank you, Councilmember uh, Ms. Keda. I appreciate all the conversations we've had as well and the discussions and uh, also appreciate that you have said repeatedly that you agree with me in the goal of uh, raising hundreds of millions of dollars of progressive revenues, you know, basically by taxing big business and the wealthy to fund affordable housing. And um, so I welcome this conversation. And I also 
uh, want to thank the thousands of ordinary people, community members who have been fighting for the Amazon tax, not just this year. I mean, this year the fight has ramped up uh, in, the, in the wake of the tremendous historic election results that we had last year where Amazon and other corporations in the Chamber of Commerce were pushed back, but also uh, hundreds who have been fighting since 2018 and uh, you know, and we don't want to repeat the disastrous scenario we had in 2018, where the majority of the council ended up betraying ordinary people and repealing the Amazon tax, which was actually much lower than what we're talking now about now. And at that time, Councilmember Mosqueda, you and I voted against the repeal, and and I think that that is the kind, same kind of spirit we need, where we absolutely hold the line. Uh, against big business trying to put the burden of this recession on ordinary people. And I just want to do echo Tristan Spears, who spoke in public comment that we, we, we have to do by our communities what we would do by our own families. And I think that if that's not the bottom line, if that's not the guiding spirit, then I don't know what can be in any honest way. So in that spirit, I welcome this conversation. And, um, and I want to do again, you know, thank the thousands who've been fighting this year because Look at the conversation we are having. It is completely on a different magnitude of revenues than uh, the one that got repealed in 2018. That shows the pressure on big business. This proposal that's come forward also, also in itself shows the pressure on big business. Obviously, I'm fighting for $500 million and no sunset clause, but the fact that this proposal exists shows that big business understands that they are not going to get away with yet again slamming working people that working people are fighting back um, on the and I want to make some general points later as well but uh, on the uh, for questions for central staff some of some discussion has happened already but I just wanted to hone in on that uh, central staff are estimating that the legislation will bring about 174 million dollars that's what we know not the promise but what actually is uh, which is about 35% of what Councilmember Morales and I have proposed in our tax Amazon legislation, would, which would bring $500 million every year. Uh, I just wanted to, you know, as a representative of uh, people who are struggling for housing, I just wanted to point out that is a big difference. And given the scope of the housing affordability crisis, I, I, I just don't understand why we should accept this much lower number other than the fact that that is the only thing that big business is willing to give in. But I, I, I will, uh, I think it's my duty to echo the people who spoke in public testimony that there's an entire movement fighting for much larger. So I think we have to focus on that. Why, why not that much larger uh, amount of funds? And then related to that is the question about how much housing, how many affordable homes would be able to build uh, uh, in the Amazon tax that we have proposed versus the proposal that we're discussing today. Uh, obviously, uh, as uh, Ali and Tracy said, it's not a straightforward thing. We have to pick a scenario of what kind of homes, like what, uh, what income uh, quintile we are directing it towards and then decide how many homes to each, you know, each quintile and then decide well, how many homes would be built overall. So obviously we have to pick a scenario so I really agree that we need to do that. I, do, I don't think it's good enough for uh, council members to say, well, we don't know because we don't know how, which homes in which category. Well, pick a category, pick a scenario and do it. I mean, in fact, we, what we did through our office is we uh, go, you know, right off the bat, what uh, we asked, uh, we had Ali and Ali was extreme, you know, she, she did a tremendous work on this, you know, pick. Uh, uh, sort of work up different scenarios, you know, assuming a wide distribution of housing across the spectrum of income distribution, uh, make some so certain assumptions and come up with some numbers. So by those scenarios, we have an estimate that our tax of a $500 million Amazon tax would build uh, roughly 10,000 affordable homes in a 10 year period, which is huge. I mean, that's, a, that's something that will, actually start putting a dent in the massive affordability crisis it's you know roughly thousand homes a year so i wonder i mean it's very this is very simple this should not be complicated just make an apples to apples comparison use the same assumptions and then see what uh, what the difference is but i will uh, so i look forward to that i, I totally understand if uh, staff cannot have that today but that's something that the public will need to review so i'm i hope and i'm sure council members will agree with me that it will be 
an unnecessary exercise, mathematical exercise for us to go through when we're comparing these two proposals to see how much we are losing if we don't have a $500 million tax. And so I would urge just mathematically speaking, please make the same assumptions across both the proposals and let's find out how many homes we can build per year. Uh, we have, as I said, we have an estimate of uh, 10,000 homes in the 10 year period. Uh, I uh, would also point out that, just two other points I wanted to point out for uh, the uh, interest of the public is, one is that when we talk about how much housing, affordable housing we would get out of one proposal versus the other, obviously the points I just made are important, which is how much we'll get each year uh, with the two different amounts. One is much less than the 500, uh, but there's another component to how much housing will be built, which is also whether the tax will be permanent or will it have a sunset clause? And I really agree with the people who said in public comment that we don't, we don't want a sunset clause on progressive revenues. We want a sunset clause on regressive revenues, which implies we want the tax on big business to be permanent. Uh, but it's, that's not just a talking point. It's actual, it's in reality what, what consequences people go through and how much we can make a dent in racist gentrification in our city uh, is going to be determined by how many dollars we put on the tables. You know, like the black community has been saying, you pay the fee for the harm you have caused us. And the fee comes in terms of dollars on the table. And if we take away the dollars on the table, which are lower to begin with than what we are, the, than the movement is fighting for. And then we say, on top of that, we're going to take away those dollars after 10 years. That means real consequences for how much housing will be built after that 10 year period. I mean, we're proposing a permanent tax of $500 million. That would mean that much, you know, thousand, roughly thousand homes every year, not just for the first 10 years. So I wanted to, include that as well and and just to just to, i mean it's an obvious point but i still need to address that which is that uh there's no question in my mind i strongly support every single one of the programs that will be funded through the proposal from council member skeda absolutely i you know i have a six-year track record of having supported all progressive causes but ultimately it's a question of arithmetic and i don't think working people i mean i think working people understand arithmetic and uh, if you have a $500 million tax versus a tax that is roughly 35% of that tax, which is less than half, then obviously what you get out of it is also less than half. So as good as all the programs are, it's going to be much less than what we would get with more money. I mean, that's simple. It's, it's, it's a simple thing. That's why uh, richer households do better because they have more money and poorer households suffer because they have very little resources. Just one other thing on the sunset clause is, um, I think, I mean, the political logic of the sunset clause has been that we have to have a regional approach. I strongly support a regional approach, but that regional approach hasn't happened because whether you talk about citywide taxes or regional taxes or state taxes, we're coming up against the same barriers, which is that big business and the wealthy don't want us to have progressive revenues because they will be taxed at any level. So, you know, the, this, this, it's the same fight at every level. So I, I want the city council to actually put its mark and say, we are fighting for the maximum possible here today. We are not going to put a trust in a regional approach which hasn't worked. And, and, and as far as, uh, and I'll end on this, I would be dishonest to the people I represent if I saw illusions in a regional approach when I've seen it failing over and over again after the repeal in 2018, we saw the one table, so-called one table that was going to be the grand regional solution. Nothing came out of it. The Macri bill did not pass earlier this year, not because it was not a good tax. Yeah, we support that tax. The reason it did not pass was because big business wanted a ban on Seattle taxes on big business, and they refused to re support the statewide bill without that ban. And ordinary people and the tax Amazon movement pushed back against the idea of a ban and we successfully defeated the attempt at such a ban. But that is why big business withdrew its support or refused to support the Macri bill and then that did not pass. So I think uh, it, 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 I think it's a question of uh, just being honest with people and seeing what works and what doesn't work. I don't think that works uh, because, not because it's regional versus citywide, it doesn't work because putting your uh, faith in big business doesn't work. I think that's the difference here. Uh, but as far I have other questions, but I'll stop here so other council members can speak as well. But I just wanted to do say that uh, let's make sure that at the next meeting we have a sort of a comparison of housing. Thank you. Uh, thank you.
Uh, I don't mean to speak over because I want to remind folks that when we speak over each other in Zoom, it's really hard for folks to hear. I know, Ali, you were about to say something. I, I want to note that we have Councilman Morales as well in the queue, and then we really need to get to the um, revenue generating bill, the tax bill, too. Um, I will also say, you know, I pushed really hard to get the number of units created. And because of the complexities that Tracy and Allie outlined, we were, um, you know, informed that it would be hard to do that in, in, without having those additional dollars to complement um, operation and maintenance. But um, I think it is a fair question that Councilmember Swan has asked for a side by side. And I think if we just look at the number of units, so if we just assume number of units, we can do that slice. And I think it would be quick before we turn over to um, Council Member Morales. Um, as a reminder for folks, if we do want to get into this comparison, which I think there's there's value in um, in, in the conversation, of, in, in the spirit of pushing forward a progressive revenue as, as, a, as a body, to understand the AMI levels that we're talking about in both bills too. Could you please speak to that real quick? Yeah, thank you, uh, Council Member Swan, Council Member Mosqueda. I did just want to, um, I don't, I don't have those numbers. Um, we, we can do some modeling, but I did, I wanted to set some expectations. And one is the, it's not an, it will be difficult to do. We can, we can compare number numbers, but it will never be a pure apples to apples comparison because um, uh, the proposal from council member Mosqueda would provide housing serving households up to zero to 50%, between zero and 50% of AMI. Uh, excuse me, area median income. And the um, council member Morales and council member Swan's proposal would fund um, housing serving households um, as cur as introduced to households up to 100% of AMI. So there are different assumptions we um, and, and require some additional green building and those sorts of things. So there are some different assumptions that apply um, based on the, the proposals as they currently stand. So we will do our best to highlight those differences and provide um, some ability to compare, but I will no just note that that focusing on housing serving, particularly people at or below 30% of area median income, um, it it requires a different investment in in housing and services, and so we will um, that those housing and service costs are built into Council Member Swan and Council Member Morales's proposal. So if we we took out the service dollars, the number of units estimated in their plan would increase, and the same with yours. So. Just want to set expectations. We'll do our best to compare and show where the assumptions are different or the same in in either um, bill. I think uh, that that's great. Thank you so much for working that magic. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Council Member Morales. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Good morning, everybody. Um, ju just to uh, respond quickly to the last point. Um, we haven't got to the amendments that I have uh, proposed on our own bill, um, but one of them uh, is to change that allocation to uh, surveying households uh, or production for 60% or, or lower. So, um, Allie, there might be something that you can use all, that is already uh, close to being crafted for um, the purposes of the comparison. I'll just offer that um, to try to shrink your workload a little bit. Um, I do want to just um, address the broader issue here about having the two different proposals um, and uh, thank uh, Councilmember Mosqueda for having some conversations with us over the last couple months. Um, you know, I think uh, I appreciate that um, this proposal um, spells out some of the COVID relief ideas that we had talked about um, and gives uh, an example of what those, you know, provides a model for what that could look like. Um, I also have a real um, issue with this sunsetting. I think we have um, we have huge needs in the city. Um, I don't anticipate, you know, we've been waiting a long time for the state legislature to address our regressive tax system, and I really don't anticipate that anything is going to change. Um, so I, I think that that's a conversation that we should definitely um, continue and really uh, kind of uh, dig in to what that means and, and why it is important for us to um, not cede that ground, at least not from the beginning of this conversation. Um, I want to turn to the Equitable Development Initiative. Um, again, I had an amendment drafted for our proposal that would set aside 10% of any revenue generated for the Equitable Development Initiative. Um, in our proposal, which seeks to raise $500 million, that, that would be $50 million for EDI. 
Um, you know, this is really about community-led development uh, that is a key to addressing racial equity. And we heard from some uh, South Core members earlier this morning. South Core, for those who don't know, stands for um, South Communities Organizing for Racial Equity. It's a race and social equity task force um, that has been advocating for building resiliency through community ownership of housing, of land, of small business space. And the coalition itself is made up of about 24 organizations um, by and for people of color. 20 of those organizations are in my district. And so this is a group of folks I've been working with for a long time. They were instrumental in crafting, advocating for and passing uh, what created the Equitable Development Initiative. Um, these are really important projects, you know, community-led projects that often need five to six million dollars to get site control, to get acquisition of property. Um, you know, one of the questions I have on the way this is described right now anyway, is that it is for, um, for housing and non-housing projects. But these organizations that are applying for this money also need sometimes, you know, a couple hundred dollars a year over a period of time to build their own capacity to be able to drive the projects that they want to see. Um, and so, you know, that's why it's really hard to hear about how the initiative, the, the staff uh, work plan has changed during COVID. I just want to, um, I, I did ask the director of um, OPCD how their work plan was going to change as a result of COVID. Um, and so some of the things that he responded, they're delaying projects so they can free up staff uh, they're exploring ways to mitigate anticipated revenue shortfalls by reducing or eliminating work. Um, you know, they are trying to support organizations, but this is a, a serious problem for the communities, uh, the, the kind of community projects that this initiative was intended to, to serve. Um, so that's why I drafted uh, the amendment. Um, calling for 10% of any revenue to be dedicated to EDI because I want to make sure that this community-led development isn't jeopardized. Um, we have to do everything we can to avoid disaster gentrification. And especially right now, you know, the, the, the need for this is permanent. Um, you know, we have to center black and brown voices as we're talking about how to allocate existing resources or backfill or allocate new resources. Um, so whether we're talking about what happens to funding when we defund the police, or we're talking about new progressive revenue, or we're talking about rebalancing, um, we have to make sure that we continue and, and really ramp up our investment in black and brown communities and in community-led development. Um, so I appreciate Council Member Mosqueda including or, or adding uh, EDI funding to her proposal um, obviously, I would prefer to see more revenue generated so that we can increase funding in those uh, projects. But at any rate, I think, you know, as we have this conversation over the next few weeks, it's really um, important incumbent upon us to commit to these investments. Uh, because I think we can all agree, especially after the conversations we've been having in the last few weeks that we, we owe our black neighbors at least 400 years worth of investment. And so it's time for us to start uh, moving in that direction. Thank you. Well, thank you, Councilman Morales. And thank you for all of your work as well on uh, your legislation. Um, I would love for us to talk about the uh, revenue bill. And I think that as we do, I want to just um, transition with the notes that you left us with, Councilman Morales, and remind folks that not only have um, Black, Brown, and Indigenous communities been left behind in our current um, economic situation prior to COVID, but because of COVID, we also know that um, communities of color, black, black, Brown, and Indigenous folks are being hit at higher rates of hospitalizations and with higher rates of death due to COVID. Um, and especially as we think about um, minority owned businesses trying to open back up the triple whammy of the existing crisis being inequitable, or I'm sorry, the existing economy being inequitable, COVID hitting communities of color hardest and that our communities of color are being left behind in the relief packages. I appreciate you lifting that up so we can center ourselves on that as we think about this conversation going forward. With that, let's go ahead and transition to um, the conversation over the revenue generating 
Hill. And I believe Dan and Tom are going to walk us through this. Allie and Tracy, thank you for uh, all of your work with walking us through that um, outline. And as folks have already noted, just the beginning of a robust conversation here. Uh, Tom and Dan, thank you for all of your work on this tax bill. Walk us through the slides. Tom, um, or Dan, let me just check your audio real quick. Uh, this is Dan Eater. I'm, I'm going to turn this straight over to uh, Tom uh, for him to walk you through his slides. Thank you, guys. Uh, good morning, uh, Madam Chair. Can you hear me? Terrific. Um, good morning, uh, members of the Slack Budget Committee. Uh, I'm Tom Meistel with the Federal Council Center for that. And um, this morning, I am going to review the um, uh, payroll expense tax, provide a, a detailed overview um, okay, through a number of slides. I think we are going to run into that same situation we had with you a month ago or so. Um, I apologize. And this, I think, is a good reminder for why we need universal broadband as a public utility um, available to everyone so everyone has high speed internet access. Um, I know Tom is on his way to call in right now so that we can have better audio. Uh, we did have this situation in the past. So if you'll bear with us for one second uh, while we get Tom on the audio, uh, IT folks should be trying to get him loaded up there. What we'll do is we'll have Tom walk us through the presentation um, while we see what he says. He will probably be on mute on his computer and he will speak into the phone if that's correct. So let's see if we have um, folks from IT letting him in. That would be great. Dan, is there any? Uh, uh, when I'm, 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 I'm actually, I'm actually online. online in background. Okay. Put, put yourself on mute on your computer, please. Perfect. Okay, we're ready to go when you are, and you can put yourself, um, if, if you're comfortable holding your hand like that, we can hear you great, and we will walk through the slides with you. Okay, this, is, this will be great. Uh, so the, uh, the next few slides um, that we'll cover this morning uh, will uh, discuss the annual revenue amount from the, the proposed tax. Uh, we'll talk about the threshold um, that determines the eligibility for different business situations. I'll touch... Uh, refresh the concept of uh, signed payroll and how that matters for um, the application of this payroll tax. Um, also go into the, the rate structure um, as the tax uh, has a, a, a different tier levels based on size of business as well as the um, size of employee compensation. Um, cover the exemptions um, that are included in the bill. Um, go uh, turn to the the date the tax becomes effective, um, due date for the uh, initial collections, and then finally wrap up with a discussion of the uh, sunset provisions in the bill. Uh, from a, a high level, the annual revenue amount that staff estimated for this tax structure is uh, approximately $174 million per year. Um, as I mentioned at the, at the front end, and we'll go into more detail in the, in the next few slides, um, there are um, two different um, size of business considerations that are included. Um, there is a, uh, a um, $7 million to $1 billion, and then a $1 billion and higher business size. Uh, the, the data that, um, that staff um, used for the estimate was provided by the State Employment Security um, Department. It's for 2019 data inflated um, using CBO's uh, wage and salary um, disbursement regional forecast. Um, the data that um, that was requested and was provided by ESD uh, describes um, the different payroll tiers um, for the different size of, of compensation levels. However, it did not provide um, sufficient detail or any detail for that matter for um, describing businesses um, above a billion dollars in size. So for that, um, in that case, um, the staff estimate does not include any estimate for um, for the, the data um, for um, incremental tax, um, higher incremental taxes for businesses of a billion dollars or higher. So uh, turning to the tax threshold, um, and this uh, actually the prior slide, if, uh, if um, we look at when the, um, the tax becomes effective for different business situations, it, um, it, it, it's uh, essentially at a, a starting threshold of $7 million of Seattle payroll or higher. 
and I'll discuss what Seattle payroll means in the next slide. Um, that amount is indexed to inflation beginning in 2022. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, when determining the payroll, the, there was essentially a three-part test that is <clears throat> used by tax administration staff. Um, one is whether or not the, the employee primarily, primarily works in the city of Seattle. Um, if in, in those instances, the, the full uh, amount of the payroll is part of the tax base and part of testing against the $7 million threshold. The, um, um, if that's not the case, if the em employee um, works in multiple locations, um, it, the test is whether or not it's 50% or more. So if the employee works 50% or more in Seattle, then, um, then the entire amount of the payroll would be assigned to, um, to Seattle for determining whether or not the payroll is part of the threshold test or not. <clears throat> and then finally, um, um, the third test is in the event where um, the employee does not work 50% or more of their time in any one location, um, but the employee resides in the Seattle, in that third case, that all, all that, that uh, payroll for that employee would be included in the tax base. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, the, uh, with regards to the, um, the rate structure, um, th this describes the, uh, the different rates that are applied in the bill. There are um, four individual rates that are determined by the size of the business payroll, as well as the, um, the size of the individual um, employee compensations that are included. Uh, and I'll, I'll touch a little bit more on the, on the, um, on the application of this in individual cases uh, in the next slide. But in general terms, um, for a business that is from $7 million to $1 billion uh, in payroll, total payroll for the year, the tax would be 0.7% on the entire uh, employee compensation for all employees earning from $150,000 to $499,999. Um, so... Uh, so essentially, in, in this case, um, there is no tax on any uh, employee compensation in any of these tiers that is below $150,000. Uh, the next year, um, for beginning with $500,000 and, and above, uh, the tax for the business from $7 million to $1 billion would be 1.4% of the total employee compensation for those, those employees at those compensation levels. Um, beginning at $1 billion, of total business payroll size, um, the tax would be 1.4% of, of the em total employee compensation for any employees earning from $150,000 to $499,000, and then a 2.1% tax on the total employee compensation um, for those employees earning $500,000 and above. And so this is just um, by way of providing an example. Um, so uh, this would be an example company with a, a total of $10 million annual payroll and uh, just a, a, a few different um, individual cases to just demonstrate how the tax would apply um, in some, in some um, kind of edge case circumstances around the margins. So first with regards to paycheck A, um, this would be an individual who earns $149,000 per year um, there would be zero tax um, as the tax kicks in, starting with a compensation of $150,000 per year. Paycheck B would be an individual earning $151,000 per year um, at this $10 million uh, size payroll company. So in this case, the tax would be 0.7% times the, the total $151,000 for a tax of $1,057. Third example, Paycheck C would be a, an employee at this company um, receiving compensation of $499,000. Uh, in this case, the tax would be, again, 0.7% times that total $499,000 for a tax, um, a tax payment of $3,493. And then finally, um, Paycheck D, this would be uh, an individual paycheck of $501,000 which would um, put that paycheck within the next year of this tax of this um, 
7 million to 1 billion size company payroll bracket, which would be 1.4% times the entire $501,000 for a, a tax bill of around $7,000. Um, with regards, um, besides the initial uh, $7 million cutoff and $150,000 of, of payroll cutoff, there are additional exemptions um, for all, all employment situations, all um, paycheck sizes and business sizes. These include grocery stores and entities for which the city does not have the authority to tax, including um, federal, state, and local government and the subsidiaries, insurance businesses, businesses that sell, manufacture, or distribute motor fuel, and businesses that sell or distribute liquor. Just to underscore that point, it wasn't a policy decision to exclude those folks. That's a category of people that we do not have the authority to tax. Correct. I'm not sure that I underscored what Tom had already said. Um, uh, next, with regards to the effective and due dates, uh, the the um, as as drafted, the tax would go into effect on January 1st of 2021. Um, the um, first payment from any any taxpayer with liability would be with the um, final quarterly payment of 2021, which is in effect uh, February of 2022. And then accounting accruals would bring the um, tax receipts forward into 2021 fiscal year to meet spending obligations. And now I'll wrap up uh, discussing the sunset provision. Um, as has been described uh, previously in today's meeting, the, the, this bill has, uh, this tax has a 10-year um, horizon and it expires on December 31st of, of 2030. There's also a codified provision uh, in the bill that is a statement of legislative intent to monitor uh, the tax, um, tax proposals at overlapping jurisdictions, for example, the state and the county, um, for any um, progressive revenue plans that are that are in the works or that are passed that would overlap with this proposal, um, and with the intent to explore amendments to to this proposal if if those circumstances arise. And I believe that is my final slide, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Tom and Dan, thank you both so much for all of your work on this legislation. Uh, Tom, thanks for being flexible with us as we adapt to um, getting central staff testimony and overview by phone. I'm looking at my council colleagues here. Please raise your hand if you do have a question. Councilmember Lewis first, anybody else? Okay, Councilmember Lewis. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so Tom, just have a, a couple of quick questions and it actually pertains um, to that last thing that you mentioned around the um, uh, possible early sunset if there was some kind of state regional um, tax uh, that came on the scene. Um, is that, uh, would that essentially require us to come back uh, and trigger another discussion where we decide to repeal it or would that happen automatically? Um, if that's the case, um, what level of regional tax uh, would be suitable to essentially um, uh, remove uh, this tax, but like, would it have to um, sort of set similar rates and be a formula that would lead to a similar level of revenue? Um, uh, thinking in terms of the um, spending plan that we discussed earlier, I wouldn't want us to be in a position where, uh, you know, there's a new regional tax, but that doesn't factor in um, uh, the commitments that we've already made to the public uh, and to the services that we wanted to provide. Um, so how would, would that process uh, work? Well, Council Member Lewis, uh, thank you for the question. Um, as currently drafted, the, uh, the codified provision would express the intent for any uh, progressive tax um, discussion at a, a regional or at a, an overlapping jurisdiction, so state or county. Um, and then it would um, would not mandate, but this uh, it expresses the the intent of the council um, to to um, as you say engage in those discussions, um, given that uh, that occurrence of of a, of a progressive um, tax proposal that's um, that's in discussion somewhere else. Um, so it's not uh, it's not mandatory. It's a statement of legislative intent. 
Um, so to, to put a fine point on it, then um, there wouldn't be an automatic repeal. It would just sort of express that uh, while we are interested in a regional solution and while we continue to wait for a regional solution, um, we, we just can't wait any longer given the scope and scale of our need. Um, but if that regional tax materialized, we're totally willing to talk about it and revisit how this is structured. But it would require us to bring it back um, to propose uh, some kind of additional measure and, and to pass it. Correct. There, there is no automatic um, course of action. It's, it's just an intent, as you described. Councilmember so, Lewis, any other questions from you? Uh, not currently. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the next person I have in the queue is Councilmember Herbold. Thank you. Um, so let's see. So first for um, slide 11 around um, eligibility, uh, could you let me know um, whether or not nonprofits meeting the annual payroll tax threshold would be uh, would be taxed? Hi, uh, Councilmember Herbold. Uh, thank you for the question. A nonprofit that is in excess of the initial seven million dollar business size would be subject to the tax to the extent that um, that nonprofit has individual um, paychecks that are above $150,000 per year. Thank you. Um, and then um, the, a, a question, another question as it relates to that, um, that eligibility, just want to um, confirm my understanding that um, the businesses that meet the threshold for the tax year based on payroll that that the businesses meet the tax th threshold for the year each year based on payroll expense in the previous year. So businesses in 2021 would meet the threshold for tax based on their payroll expense in 2020. Is that correct? That's correct. It's, it's um, always looking back to the prior year. And similarly, since uh, I believe that this uh, this tax structure um, also creates uh, eligibility for 20, 2020. Um, it would, uh, businesses in 2020 would meet thresholds on tax base in their payroll expense in 2019. Is that correct? Uh, there is, uh, the tax goes into effect on um, of January 1st of 2021, so there would be no 2020 tax liability. So the first test would be um, determining um, eligibility for the tax in 2021, looking back at 2020. So this this uh, this, this different structure um, addresses the concern I had raised um, last week about the uh, the Swant um, Morales proposal that. Uh, would um, make that would start charging in 2020, even though it wasn't going to be collected in 2021, based on 2019 revenues. In in my concern that um, 2019 revenues would not be necessarily um, illustrative uh, on the health of a business or the revenues collected by a business in 2020. Tom, uh, this is Dan uh, Eater. I, 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 correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think I have it right that the measure of the tax is different than the eligibility threshold in terms of which right, year. Right, and, and I'm talking specifically about eligibility threshold. Thank okay, you. Very good. Um, so, I, to to kind of pivot back to to the question. Um, Yes, the, to the extent that the, um, the, the, the proposal we were discussing last week was um, establishing a tax effective in 2020, it was um, looking back at 2019. This is establishing a tax um, starting in 2021, so it's looking back to, um, to 2020. Thank you. Um, and then uh, my last set of questions relate to slide 13. Um, just wondering whether or not you have uh, first estimates of numbers of business that might each might meet each threshold uh, payroll of seven million or or one billion, um, and if you have the estimates of the uh, number or spread of salaries over the threshold amounts of one hundred fifty uh, and 
five hundred thousand um, dollars and um, just want to understand what the what the revenue estimate of 173 million in 2021 is is based on okay uh, so with regards to the number of businesses um, there is some overlap as, as you could could imagine between uh, because uh, business that participates at the um, 140 150 thousand to 499 thousand um, payroll uh, level who has employees who are within that bracket and in not all circumstances will have employees at the hundred uh, five hundred thousand uh, dollars dollars and higher so um, uh, based on uh, a rough view of, of the numbers and the businesses that were um, in the um, um, hundred and fifty thousand dollars, so at least one hundred and fifty thousand and higher. Um, it was approximately two point seven percent of the total accounts that were included in the Employment Security Department data, which is on the order of seven hundred and twenty two businesses. And again, that is um, there may be there may be uh, a case where there is a business who has um, individuals and, and a, a, has a, as an employee, that shows in the 500,000 plus bracket and, and then employees in the 150,000 lower bracket um, that wouldn't be picked up in that number, um, but it's, it's likely few, if any. Um, with regards to the, um, the estimates of the different payroll bases, so the, um, the 2021 estimate, so this is using the ESD starting point and inflating it using um, CBO's wage and salary growth uh, growth estimates from their pessimistic forecast. Um, numbers uh, support approximately $14.3 billion in the 150,000 to 499,000 um, tier of compensation and um, $5.2 billion in the um, 500,000 plus tier of employee compensation. And again, um, as, I, as I led with on, on the, I believe the first slide, this is only describing the information that um, was available um, that was available freely from the Department of Employment Security, um, and it does not attempt to describe any any estimates above the one billion dollar payroll tier for the incremental um, tax bracket for that. Piece. So, if we find if we find out that there are more businesses in the uh, um, that have payroll above one billion, we conceivably could be generating more revenue than anticipated. It, I would. I would I would use that and say it's um, the, the the base revenue estimates include um, include the entire amount of revenue that any size of business over seven million dollar seven million dollars per year would would be paying to the extent that they have um, employees earning over one hundred fifty thousand dollars at the 0.7 and one point four percent tax rates. What is not included and what um, what may may be the way of, of additional revenue if if the data was available is the um, the amount that would be generated from a business that is a billion dollars or higher that has employees over one hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars of annual compensation for the additional 07 percent rate at, um, that are in both um, pay uh, compensation tiers. Thank you, um, and uh, I just want to close out with a, a, a statement about a couple different things. Um, one, as it relates to the sunset, um, Councilmember Lewis talked about the legislative intent um, about whether or not the, um, the state might uh, fix our broken tax code and um, make it more progressive. Um, that is legislative intent that uh, of, of something that might happen in uh, hopefully in uh, in very near term. There is a sunset clause um, in the bill for uh, 10 years from now. Um, I um, I don't believe in 10 years a city council will determine that we don't need progressive revenue anymore um, if the if the state were were to act. So um, I think this is um, potentially a useful tool to incentivize um, the state to act um, and to um, uh, to incentivize a a cleaner non non patchwork um, type type uh, tax code. Um, so I am not 
terribly disturbed by the sunset um, if, if the state fails to act over the next 10 years to uh, correct our upside down tax code. Um, the city council um, uh, would, would um, very likely um, act to block um, the tax code because we will still have um, the same challenges that we have now and we will have funding uh, for a lot of really important programs that help our communities um, baked into our, our budget. Um, one other point I'd like to make is although um, as it relates to specifically the, um, the proposal um, that Council Member Sawant and Morales made, I have expressed my concerns that that proposal um, makes businesses um, uh, el uh, eligible or required to uh, pay taxes in 2020 based on their eligibility in 2019. With this particular model, I would be less concerned um, about this tax kicking in um, in 2020 based on 2019 eligibility because the, the situation I've been concerned about with the, with the, um, uh, the, the model uh, proposed by council members Sawant and Morales is that in this very uncertain uh, business climate, um, you know, for instance, a, a business of 200 employees all making minimum wage would, would meet that threshold um, uh, and and that particular business in, in 2020 may not uh, be doing as well as they were doing in, uh, in 2019. Since this particular model is really focused and zeroes in on, um, on higher salaries, from my perspective, if you um, as a business are um, still have um, a significant significant number of employees that are making these higher salaries um, in 2020, I, I am less concerned um, about having the requirement kick in in 2020 based on 2019 um, payroll um, uh, amounts. So I'm, I'm just sort of throwing that out there to test the waters because that might be um, one way of growing the size of um, of the, the revenue generated by this tax. Thank you very much, Councilmember Herbold. Um, I have two folks in the queue. First, Councilmember Morales, and then I saw Councilmember Sawant. If there's anybody else, please ping me. I just, can I just double check before we go on, Dan and uh, Tom? Um, we're talking about uh, assessing 2021 um, payroll, correct? So in 2022, the payments start, but we're looking at 2021. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, thank you. So I think Council Member uh, Herbal, your, your point is well taken. And it, to the extent that there are companies over that payroll threshold, and they have salaries that are six figures, you know, including half a billion dollars in, in payroll, um, in a time where we're post COVID in a recession in 2021, I think your, your point is, is well taken. Thank you. And Councilmember Mosqueda, before you move on to another council member, because I just don't want to um, lose my opportunity to say how much I support um, this proposal. And I'm really excited that you have brought it forward um, and have it uh, be uh, both focused on what the needs of our communities are, um, whereas it, it is it is a start and there, the needs are great and this is not going to address all of them. Um, I think that this more of a scalpel approach um, is, is better, again, given the uncertainty of um, so many businesses in our community, balanced with the uncertainty of uh, people's, people's lives who need these services. Um, and, uh, and really, this is, I think, a, a much more, I mean, I really believe in the ideals of, of a progressive uh, tax structure, and I think this is much uh, more um, focused and progressive um, than uh, the other the other version, that, uh, a model that I have myself um, been been supportive of in, in, in the past, um, and I just really want to indicate um, my support uh, for for your legislation, and um, would would like to indicate my my interest in in co-sponsoring the legislation if you would if you would have me. 
Uh, thank you, Council Member Herbold. Yeah, absolutely. I uh, would love to have any council members who would like to sign on. Um, I want to recognize, though, that we're very early in the conversation, much more um, to be uh, decided or hammered out among our, our colleagues here with regards to progressive revenue. So thank you for that early um, indication of support and happy to have you sign on. Um, council Member Morales, Council Member Swant, and council, uh, council President Gonzalez are the three folks that we have lined up. And I'll turn it over to, and Council Member Peterson. I'll turn it over to Council Member Morales. Thank you so much. Um, I really just have a clarif clarification, uh, sorry, a question of clarification. Um, as we're talking about um, the issue of uh, it's listed in the bill as maintaining a level playing field and the sunset, um, I'm reading this as two separate things. Um, that we would um, sunset if another jurisdiction passes progressive revenue uh, and what that means is to be determined. Um, and if not, we would sunset in 10 years. Um, can I just get some clarification that those two things are not tied together either or uh, whichever comes first, I guess, would trigger the sunset? Anyone? That's correct. Okay. They, are, they are separate. So it is not the case that um, that uh, they have to, but that they would have to be tied together. That I was uh, losing the thread there, and uh, I forget which council member was asking the question, but um, either one of those would uh, would trigger the sunset. And um, in the first case. Uh, if another jurisdiction uh, passed progressive revenue, then uh, the council would have to act. And in the second case, if the 10 years expired, it would just expire. You, you've got that correct, council member. Okay. Thank but you. but um, can I add one more piece? Because I want to make sure it's it's um, basically the intent for the future councils to consider whether or not they would want to take something up. So they wouldn't have to, Councilman Morales, if something were to pass at the state level, they wouldn't have to. Um, but I think your point is very well taken. The way that it's written is about intent. Well, and I just, you know, I wonder because um, it, because it doesn't designate, you know, what is considered significant. Um, I guess my, my interest, I'll just say, um, my interest would be in, um, if we're going to keep a sunset, that it only be if uh, some other jurisdiction passed significant um, revenue uh, that would meet or exceed what we are trying to capture here. So I know that, you know, I guess that's what I'm really getting at is that if we're going to keep that claw, uh, keep a sunset, it shouldn't be in 10 years. It should only be if, if this revenue is able to get generated in some other way. Thank you, Councilmember Morales. Any additional questions from you? Oh, okay, thank you very much. Um, and it looks like Tom is trying to call back in. So for the IT folks, just wanna make sure we have Tom on the line as well in case there's questions for him. Council Member Sawant, and then we have um, Council President Gonzalez and Peterson. Thank you. Um, I wanted to make some points, but I also felt there were many misleading remarks in, in the last few minutes and I need to clarify that uh, for the members of the public who are watching and people who are fighting for the Amazon tax who are watching. I mean, the, 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 the bill doesn't, the bill that's under consideration right now doesn't take effect until January 2021. So it charges no tax for 2020. So we have to note that in the middle of a pandemic recession, that is hundreds of millions of dollars of lost revenue. Um, and uh, I think the bill, uh, just a side point, but an important one is that it pays off the loans by spending almost nothing in 2021. Whereas in the Amazon tax bill, we have full, the full 2021 revenue because the loans are paid off by the eventually collected 2020 taxes. But the main point I wanted to focus on is the hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue that will be lost by not charging taxes for 2020. And uh, I, 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 I really object to the way Councilmember Herbold has characterized the process of tax collection. It's all very sleight of hand. 
and there was one misleading remark. But the sleight of hand is this whole sort of building this um, boogeyman of how the poor businesses that are struggling, how will they pay taxes if they uh, have, uh, you know, if they have struggled or so on. So let's be very clear. If a company has gone belly up, they're not going to pay taxes. But it is a question, it's, an, it, it's a recursive question because the way everybody pays taxes is you pay taxes this year on the income you had made last year. That is the same for corporations, that is the same for households. So for all the tears that are being spilled for the largest businesses, let's keep in mind, we're talking about the largest, at least as far as the Amazon tax is concerned, the largest 2% of businesses that uh, we're uh, talking about, they are the business owners who are many of them billionaires, multimillionaires. This is not a tax on workers. And I want to come to that in a second, because again, there are very misleading points that are being made. Uh, whether intentionally or not, that's a different question. I'm, I, I'm not even going there, but just as a matter of accuracy, we need to keep that in mind. Um, but the sleight of hand is in uh, sort of this pretense that somehow this taxation, the, the sort of the recursive taxation approach is somehow unique to business and not to people. But no, it's, it's that, that's, the, that's the simple mechanism of tax payment. You pay taxes this year on the income you made last year. So it's just, I just find it just uh, sort of outrageous that uh, this whole, uh, this impression is being given that somehow there's something unique for businesses. And, as, and if you're so concerned about businesses that are going to be struggling the recession, what about working people? 45 million work, American workers have said that they have lost their jobs and they're, they're filing for insu uh, unemployment insurance. This is, a, this is a crisis that is in some aspects going to be worse than the Great Depression. And any household, uh, again, any household that lost a job this year, it has to pay taxes on the income that they had last year. So unless you're pretending that the mechanism is different for households versus businesses, th this point has absolutely no merit whatsoever. And furthermore, as uh, one of the uh, people in public comments stated, the tax obligation of such a large corporation with $7 million of payroll uh, is is so minimal compared to the tax obligations that ordinary people have. And then look at the compounded uh, situation that they're facing with uh, or having the most regressive tax system on top of that having major difficulties in their lives because of the pandemic recession. And so uh, I, uh, I don't agree with Council Member Herbold, you know, the health of businesses. What about the 2019 health of ordinary people? Uh, uh, they're still going to be paying taxes. I mean, the tax date has just been deferred, uh, but but they still have to pay taxes unless the federal government says no taxes owed for uh, all working class households, which they certainly should do. Um, that is still an obligation that workers are going to have to have and nobody's coming and saving them. Nobody's telling them you don't need to pay taxes because we're gonna write a legislation that takes care of you. Uh, I've never heard any politicians spend this much time talking about ordinary people's tax obligations, especially, you know, we are all elected officials in a city with the nation's most regressive tax system. So where is the balance of your commentary? How much commentary on uh, poor big businesses and how little on what actual working people are going to face? Um, and then the, uh, the thing that was absolutely misleading is this idea that businesses that lost, that under the Amazon tax, framework, the in businesses that lost income this year will be charged under our bill. That's not, that's not accurate at all. Uh, that's misleading. Uh, on the, um, I wanted to move to another point, And I, I wonder if Tom can pull up the slide that says paycheck slide, where there's paycheck um, A, B, C, and so on. Uh, it's not so much that I have questions on that slide. I just want that slide uh, that the public can see, because I'm trying to make a point about how this slide has been made, and, and, and I also want to do assure central staff that this is not a comment directed at the central staff or their work, but just the approach that's being used here by the, uh, by the city council members who are advocating for this, uh, which is that this is this, this type of, of you know, presenting it in this way, uh, where you are uh, saying that sort of you're, you're attaching the tax obligations to uh, the salaries of particular employees, that's very misleading. I mean, just to be clear at the outset, I absolutely support 
taxing those who, who are making outrageous amounts of income, like $500,000 or more, half a million dollars or more. So CEO salary is completely out of control. I completely agree with that. But we have to be very careful here. The way this information is being presented is extremely misleading because uh, it's sort of confusing two different types of tax mechanisms and presenting them as one. But it, that, that plays right into the right-wing talking points. Um, this, the presenting this information this way suggests that the taxes, this tax, the corporate payroll tax, is on workers' salaries. That is not accurate. It is a tax on big businesses, not a tax on incomes of high-income households. That's, those are two different tax regimes altogether. And uh, confusing the two, I think it's being done sort of in, in a way as to sort of play into this idea that the Amazon tax is, is, is as proposed by, a, by our movement, is not as progressive or maybe even regressive compared to this proposal because this proposal puts taxes on those who are uh, earning high incomes. And we see how misleading that is because we saw a public comment from a very well-meaning tech person who said, tax me. Yeah, I'm all for taxing high incomes. I, I totally support that. And I appreciate all the high income workers who say tax me because it's regressive. But the, we are not talking about taxes on incomes of people or of workers. We're talk, talking about corporate payroll tax. And to, to be clear, the mechanism of corporate payroll is the same across uh, the Mosquito proposal and uh, the Amazon tax proposal. So it, this applies to both. This, but this is quite problematic, presenting it this way, because it plays right into the right-wing talking points that uh, suggest that somehow the taxes are on workers. The taxes are not on workers. The taxes are not on small businesses. The taxes are not on medium-sized businesses. The taxes are on the big corporations. And as far as that's concerned, I think we have to be clear that, again, this was a misleading point from Council Member Herbold, that somehow uh, a business with 200 employees all making minimum wage is, a, is it's so sad if they were taxed. No. This is a tax on the corporation that is profiting off exploiting its workers. So think about all the contractors of Amazon. I don't know if they are registered in Seattle and will, they will be taxed or not, but I'm just using them as an example. Those contractors, you know, they hire, they hire the delivery drivers, the cargo handlers, and so on, that uh, deliver Amazon packages. Those corporations, the people who own the corporations, the major shareholders, they make massive profits because, precisely because they under, grossly underpay their employees, those employees are exploited. So uh, not taxing that corporation is not helping the workers in any way. You're just letting the owners of that corporation go scot-free. And it's, uh, again, I'm, I mean, I'm, I know I'm laying a point on this, but this is extremely important not to be misleading. I wanted to say also that uh, this, this, this kind of confusion has, an, has not, it, this is not the first day that this confusion has come in. Unfortunately, uh, it was even at the press conference that Councilmember Mosqueda held yesterday, which, I, as I said, I strongly support any and every progressive revenue proposals. And in that spirit, as I've said before, and I underline it yet again, uh, I uh, have worked with Councilmember Mosqueda, and I'm happy to and I want to continue to do that. However, I would also be failing in my duty to working people if I uh, didn't point out glaring problems. I mean, at the press conference yesterday, Steve Hopper, who is the president of Ethan's Tower Restaurants, said that our legislation, the Sawant Morales legislation, is quote unquote massively regressive to mid sized businesses and low wage workers. This is not true. And all the points we've heard today, they play into that idea that this corporate payroll tax is a tax on uh, either small businesses or on workers. It, it is not. It's a tax on the largest corporations. And some of the largest corporations, not all, but some of them, uh, make a lot of money because, precisely because they underpay their employees. So I would really urge the council, regardless of which proposal you support, and I hope you support at least one of these proposals, uh, uh, regardless of which proposal you support, I hope that we can at least have uh, basic clarity and honesty in how we are presenting some of these points so that we are not being um, you know, misleading towards uh, ordinary people who, are, who don't have the time to engage in every single detail. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Sawant. I appreciate the clarification that you offered about who pays um, in under either scenario. And I, speaking of clarification, I think uh, Councilmember Herbold had a slight clarification she wanted to offer, and I'll move on to Councilmember President Gonzalez. 
Uh, thank you. I'll keep it super short. I just um, I would just want to reiterate um, that my point, regardless of whether or not we have a, a disagreement of whether or not um, Councilmember Mosqueda, your um, your proposal interjects more progressivity. I do not think that the the Sawant Morales proposal is uh, lacks progressivity. It does lack. It does have progressivity, um, but it it yours is is I believe more finely tuned on those businesses. Nobody is saying that that employers or employees are paying this tax. The businesses are paying the tax, but this this proposal is focused on the businesses that have a lot of high wage employees. Um, but th this back and forth, I think, um, obscures the fact that in um, Councilmember Swant's efforts to uh, refute my comments or to suggest that I'm being, um, I'm being, uh, uh, I'm misleading the public about who pays the tax, um, I want to underscore the fact that what I just suggested is that we amend the bill to start the tax in 2020, just like her and council member Morales bill does. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you for the Can clarification I, uh, on what your amendment was intended to do. Council member Swan, very briefly. Uh, yes, I, I just, um, I mean, I, I appreciate the spirit in which council member Herbold uh, presented that. And of course I want to uh, absolutely uh, you know, I will fight for a, any possible progressive legislation, I, and I have shown that through my uh, entire track record. Uh, but uh, the bottom line, I think, that needs to be made, of course, in terms of what is more progressive, what is less progressive. I mean, if you agree, technically speaking, that this tax is on the business, not on the employees, then you cannot say then say that this is more progressive because the only only universe in which the idea, the claim that the Mosquito proposal is more progressive than the Amazon tax. Uh, the only uh, universe in which that holds any accuracy is if you accept the, this right wing point that somehow this is a tax on workers. It is not a tax on workers, it's a tax on corporations. And, uh, and, and just keeping it very simple, what is more progressive? A tax that raises far more revenues from the, from the entities that have had enjoyed a tax haven for decades. That's the Amazon tax. The tax that continues into perpetuity, that's the Amazon tax. And the tax that has a higher tax rate on these profiteering businesses, which is the Amazon tax. In fact, if uh, the Mosqueda proposal, uh, uh, the tax rate was increased to 1.3%, that just that alone, I mean, our back of the envelope calculation is that alone would raise something like $80.7 million additional. So let's just keep focus on what actually is progressive. Thank you. Council members, I, I appreciate what you are saying. I think the clarification um, is helpful and uh, council member, I'm gonna move us on. I do appreciate that uh, we are not in person and it's hard to have these discussions sometimes. So um, I wanna thank uh, again, council member Herbal for your, your clarification and council member Salon for yours as well. Let's move on to council president Gonzalez followed by council member Peterson. Um, hi, um, thank you so much. Um, appreciate the opportunity to just uh, make a few brief comments. Um, I just wanted to um, um, acknowledge that I think this is a really important conversation for us. Um, obviously, um, the dire state of our budget is one that we need to take very seriously. Um, and and um, I just wanted to, again, signal my um, support for um, progressive revenue um, through uh, these various proposals. Um, I would agree with council member um, Sawant that I think at the at the end of the day, um, you know, this council has to take a very strong position on um, progressive uh, revenue models that might be available to us. And I appreciate the spirit in which I believe council member Mosqueda has presented this proposal, which is let's put all available proposals on the table for consideration and discussion and debate. Uh, and ultimately, uh, we will have an opportunity as a council to consider um, these progressive revenue proposals. Um, I, I think, again, setting, a, setting aside the question of degrees of progressivity, as, um, as indicated by Council Member Herbold, I think it's fair to say that we have two um, 
two proposals on the table right now that are both um, progressive in, in nature. And um, I think it's gonna be important for us to make sure that we have a you know full vetting of both of the proposals to make sure that we as council members feel like we are comfortable choosing one uh, over the over the other. Um, and I, you know, I can I I I am gonna be supportive of all of um, the progressive proposals um, because I think we just need to make sure that we are staying um, committed to, to identifying revenue sources that aren't gonna be on the backs of uh, working families in our city who are just bearing the brunt of uh, taxation in our city and in our state right now. So I, I really wanna thank um, council members Sawant and Morales and Mosqueda for your thoughtful approach here in, in proposing um, uh, something uh, that we can all consider. I do um, want to signal that I, um, at this point, you know, would prefer Council Member Mosqueda's um, proposal in large part one of the, because of the, the spending plan related to immigrant and refugees in particular. That was something that I found was missing in the prior proposal, and I understand that we could amend things um, accordingly, but I'm interested in making sure that we are um, meeting the needs of um, immigrants and refugees who've, who've been completely left out uh, of uh, prior um, uh, uh, relief um, funds and and really appreciate the integration of um, so look forward to continuing to dig into the details and to learning more and to continuing to engage our constituencies uh, to make sure that we uh, continue to advance um, a plan that is going to meet the um, significant needs of our communities as we um, begin to recover or think about how to recover from this economic crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Council President. Um, I really appreciate your words. And I think uh, we are, uh, we, I caught just a little bit at the end there. So if there's something else that I missed, um, I'll follow up with you, but I appreciate your, your comments. Um, Council President. I'm sorry about that. I I got completely disconnected, so I'm so sorry about that's that. Okay, that's okay. Um, Council Member Peterson, thank you for waiting. Thank you, Council Member. And I really appreciate Council Member Mosqueda, you putting forward another option on the table for consideration. And uh, I know your team did a lot of hard work on this and wanna thank City Council Central staff who's been working extremely hard over numerous proposals and also appreciate the outreach you did, Councilmember Mosqueda, on this. That that's really important. That outreach that you did to various stakeholders and um, to to be frank, I mean, I'm still reviewing the three ordinances. They were provided yesterday, and I know that's part of the discussion during the, the budget rebalancing. Interested in seeing how the mayor is proposing to rebalance the 2020 budget, just so we have all the information at the same time, and I'll be able to have more comprehensive questions at, at that time, but just wanted to thank you and all the staff that put everything together. I guess the one, uh, a couple starting questions for me are the, um, the revenue estimates, are they based on pre-COVID economic numbers? They're, I heard they were from 2019, so does that mean they're, we don't really have, yet have the benefit of seeing how much revenue we could raise at these particular tax rates at this time. It's just our best guess from 2019 figures. Uh, thank you for the question, council member um, Peterson. So the, to explain, uh, to answer that question, I'll just explain how the estimate was generated. Um, the starting point was the 2019 Employment Security Department um, payroll data. And then uh, the next step was to uh, to inflate, or in this case, deflate um, those figures to a 2021 number. And uh, I did that using um, the city budget office's um, econ uh, regional economic forecast number for wage and salary disbursements, which uh, indicated uh, a 15% decline um, from 19 to 20 and a 3% decline uh, from 20 to 21. So. Um, that was the, the mechanism used in this estimate to um, to chew up given economic circumstances. Thank you. 
And so again, I'm just still reviewing these bills. I appreciate the opportunity to um, dig deeper into these. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilmember Peterson. Are there any other comments from folks? I see Councilmember Strauss. Councilmember Strauss, please. Thank you, Chair Mosqueda. I had reserved, I had comments for our earlier section of the discussion and with time being limited, I also wanted to ensure that we didn't run over time today because I know we have a lot of, uh, we have a lot of opportunity for further discussion. What I know from both the uh, meeting that you held last, last month, as well as looking at and analyzing past recessions is that austerity measures don't work. We need to have a healthy middle class if we are going to have a healthy economy. And so in your spending plan, what I really truly appreciate is your focus on the childcare uh, and your focus generally on the requests that we have heard from Seattleites across our city. Uh, that is about childcare, that's also about rental assistance so that we ensure that the burden of not being able to meet rent doesn't land on an individual, that we as a city are here to support both individuals and small businesses. I also really appreciate the focus on immigrant and refugee affairs as we know that other levels of government aren't providing these important resources. And finally, the ability to support small businesses who have small margins. These small businesses across our city really make the fabric of our city unique and vibrant. And so your spending plan, I believe, is very clear. I, I really appreciate it. Um, and thank you. Uh, looking at the taxing section, it is also clear and easy to understand. Not having to focus on gross receipts ensures that we're not taxing companies that have slim margins, that we are really focusing on, uh, on even when I look at our own payroll taxes from the federal, state, and local governments, th this allows us to be focused and, and nuanced with how we are applying taxes. Um, I really do appreciate your call out for higher levels of government to pass tax taxes and, and our ability to almost as if it's a reverse preemption because really we need the state to act. It would be great for the county to act. And if they're not gonna act, we still cannot create an austerity budget in this moment in history. Um, the, what I've seen throughout you know, my time working in government is many, many pieces of legislation have sunset clauses and sunset clauses can be important time checks for us to be able to revamp uh, or retool the, the bills and the, and the pieces of legislation before us. I think that both of these aspects of this bill really do help put pressure on the state government and the state government really needs to act. And what we have seen is that they have fumbled for years and we can't wait for them to continue fumbling, especially in this moment in history. Um, this, this bill also allows our, our businesses and our community members to stabilize during this crisis and and not to get ahead you know we all need to be able to take these pieces of, of legislation into consideration as we're making decisions into the future and so i really do appreciate the fine-tuned as councilmember herbal stated the fine-tuned nature of this bill i do have to say i had a lot of questions today and thank you to my council colleagues for asking those questions um, specifically Councilmember Herbold, you, you asked some really great questions. Um, I do have a couple more questions and, I, and I'll follow up with Tom after this meeting. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, absolutely. Any other comments or questions from folks? I'm not seeing any hands. Um, I do want to note that Councilmember Gonzalez, as she was getting off the phone, uh, or off the line, um, she did let us know, she let me know that she does want to sign on as a co-sponsor. She was breaking up a little bit at the end there. Uh, so I wanna just say that uh, for folks knowledge and I wanna appreciate everybody's questions. This is again, the beginning as we look at um, large corporations paying taxes, again, not on individuals, um, thinking about how we identify uh, where we slice that and, and asking those in a post-COVID world, uh, especially to help uh, small businesses, um, immigrants and refugees, 
uh, low wage workers and our homeless and unhoused, I'm, I'm our homeless and um, unstably housed folks to be able to get the support they need so that they can not only survive COVID and the economic crisis, but so that we can rebuild a more resilient local economy. This is a really helpful conversation and it's almost two o'clock. I want to just double check that there's no other hands going up. Seeing none, I want to thank our folks from the central staff office. I know you put a lot of work into these slides and I think that the slide that you did on the math really just helps uh, businesses understand who pays that tax. I think it's important that we keep reminding folks this is about which businesses and how large those businesses are and at what slice of within those large largest corporations are going to be paying that tax. So appreciate the math that you did there um, and all of the presentations that you have put together. Your time is appreciated. We know you guys are constantly working around the clock and that's not fair to you. Uh, we appreciate it and we'll do, I will do a better job of, uh, of um, making sure that we both appreciate you and also constantly think about how much work we're requiring of our team at Central Staff. Uh, thanks to the communication staff and our team within my office for all of the work that they did, especially Sigil Creek for um, helping shepherd us through multiple conversations and to the entire team, Aaron House, Farida Cuevas, and Aretha Basu for putting together this proposal that we're talking about today. We will adjourn at this point, or I, I should say we will put a stay on our calendar, um, our, our, our meeting here, and we will reconvene at 2 p.m. This will be the continuation of the Select Budget Committee to focus on our budget budgetary items. We do not have the draft proposed budget from the mayor's office for the 2020 supplemental, uh, I should say 2020 rebalancing budget, but we will have a conversation that continues around our Seattle Police Department's inquest and uh, hearing from other cities actions they're considering or have taken. We're all in this together as we as local electeds respond to the cry for action urgent action to defund, to reprioritize and reinvest. So looking forward to that conversation coming up at 2 p.m. Colleagues, enjoy your lunch break. <laughs>